Okay. Um, so uh, welcome everyone. Um, our special guests today are uh, Professor Kendall R. Phillips, Dr. Martin Hudson, and Sridhi Purkaisto. So good morning and good evening speakers and to everyone attending this discussion uh, from different parts of the world. Um, in this session, uh, we uh, will try to open up a platform uh, for ontological analysis and uh, the ontology of ghosts um, with the help of cinema, uh, sociology, and uh, mythology. Um, and, uh, and, and perhaps uh, the session is more relevant uh, now uh, during the current pandemic, uh, you know, when we have dead bodies, uh, you know, pushed into anonymity, uh, you know, often to hide data uh, from public eyes. Um, so welcome all the speakers. So we will begin uh, with our first speaker, Kendall R. Phillips, uh, who has a PhD from Penn State uh, and is a professor of uh, communication and rhetorical studies uh, at uh, Syracuse University, where he studies uh, the intersection of politics and popular culture. His work engages topics like public memory, popular film, and popular culture. He has published several books, including the forthcoming A Cinema of Hopelessness, The Rhetoric of Refusal in 21st Century American Film, uh, Place of Darkness, uh, The Rhetoric of Horror in Early American Cinema, and Projected Fears, Horror Films in American Culture. His essays have appeared in such journals as Quarterly Journal of Speech, Communication Monographs, and the Philosophy and Rhetoric, and he is co-editor for the book series, of Horror and Monstrosity Studies at the University's Press of Mississippi and Rhetoric, Politics and Society for Paul Grave Macklin. Professor Phillips currently serves as founding co-director for the Lender Center for Social Justice at SU, a visiting professor at York St. John University, UK, and honorary fellow in the School of Art, Witi Orohuya. Um, College of Creative Arts at uh, Massey University, New Zealand. He previously served as president for the Rhetoric Society of America, and his talk is titled um, Shadows in the Dark, Ghosts and the Development of American Cinema. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Phillips, uh, for, for joining us today, and it's over to you. Thank you so much. So I'm going to, oh, is it possible for me to share my screen? Is it is, it is. I think it is. Yeah, it should be. Uh, okay. Please try. It does say host disabled, so I don't know. If okay, a way no, no, just that. wait. Just give me a second. Um, Hello, everybody. Welcome to the twenty first century. Where... <laughs> yeah, can you will you will you try this one? Try again, please. Uh, it still says host disabled. So okay, right. Okay, okay. Now, 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 try once, please. Voila, merci. Oh, yeah, okay. Perfect. Excellent, thank you so much. Right, okay. It'll just be a lot more interesting to look at my screen than to look at me. I'm not, <laughs> okay. I'm not that interesting, but I assure you my screen is, is hopefully pretty interesting. I, I hope everybody can see uh, that. Uh, uh, Sajid, can you see the? Yeah, it's perfectly visible, it's perfect. Yeah, yeah, it is. Perfect, well, first of all, thank you, uh, Fresh Dada, for uh, inviting me. It's a, it's a real honor. Uh, and it's interesting, actually, you know, uh, probably other people will make this observation, um, but I do feel like I'm living in a world filled with ghosts these days. I, I, most of my interaction with my friends and colleagues and students and loved ones are in this kind of disembodied, present but not present virtual environment. And if, if people were here at the beginning, every meeting I have is like a seance. You know, you're saying, are you there? Can you show me, show me a sign of life, right? I can't hear you, I can see you, but, and it does feel like we're living in ontologically an environment where um, bodies have become something very different, uh, both in the sense that bodies have been kind of removed from our view uh, and turned into numbers and statistics and, and uh, these horrible death rates, uh, but also just our contact with other human beings is increasingly in this very ethereal, ephemeral, uh, virtual environment. So uh, obviously, I would much rather be uh, there uh, with you in Kolkata or other parts of the world. Uh, but here I am in upstate New York, thrilled to uh, reach you, even if just in my ghost ghostly spectral uh, presence. Um, now, I should begin by saying uh, that my talk is not about ghosts. Uh, at least not real ghosts. Uh, and in fairness, I, I, I don't really believe in ghosts. So I'm sorry if people do. Uh, my focus is really on the representations of ghosts or thinking about how ghosts perform a certain kind of cultural work 
that help us understand the world. And I think hopefully that will have some useful intersections with the bigger questions of ontology, uh, but I will allow our esteemed audience and uh, moderator uh, to help make those connections. Uh, the last thing I'll say just as a kind of a preface is um, that I am very much an American, uh, as my accent probably reveals. Uh, and so the US is an interesting environment in relation to ghosts. Um, most of our folklore or beliefs about ghosts really come from other cultures, uh, a lot from Europe and Britain through the Catholic Protestant church and immigration, uh, increasingly a lot coming from indigenous first nations and native traditions, uh, as well as from South Asia, China, Korea, Japan. So we as a nation largely made up of immigrants have become a, a pot where lots of different cultural traditions about ghosts have been mixed together. Uh, and so I don't know that the US has made a lot of really unique contributions uh, to the mythology or folklore around ghosts. But where I do think uh, the US has made a fairly substantial contribution to the global cultural conception of ghosts and spirits uh, is through cinema. Um, for a variety of historical reasons that I'm happy to talk about in Q&A, uh, the US really has been the dominant force in developing motion pictures through most of its first century. Now, that, that is changing. Uh, we are now in a moment where the largest box office in the world uh, is China. Uh, China has more uh, uh, they have more uh, they have more screens and movie theaters than we do in the U.S. There are more money generated there than there is in the U.S. Um, and we are not the United States is not the largest producer of films. That is India. Uh, India for some years has produced many more films uh, than we have in the United States. But still, uh, even though we're seeing a rise in other global national cinemas in China. Uh, India and other places, the U.S. for virtue of its kind of historical uh, preeminence still has had, I'll call it, a disproportionate impact on the overall grammar and language of cinema. Uh, let's see if I can make this go forward. Yeah. Oh, a strange little X on there, but I, that must be a ghost put that X. I'm not sure what that is. Um, so I want to begin by uh, thinking that broadly, the, the thesis of my talk is to think about the role that ghosts have played uh, in framing cinematic storytelling in the US context and the way US storytelling in the cinematic context has subsequently shaped the way we think about ghosts and the roles that they play. Now here, I do want to begin by acknowledging that there are actually a lot of different ways uh, that filmmakers use ghosts and a, and a number of different kinds of stories we tell about ghosts. Uh, for me, the focus of mine will be on these top examples, uh, the ghost as a frightening entity. Uh, so this is at the top left, uh, uh, still from a 1981 film called Ghost Story. I'll talk about a little more later. Uh, next to that is a 1982 film called Poltergeist, uh, Steven Spielberg film. And so these are one type of stories we tell about ghosts, stories that ghosts are frightening, terrifying entities coming to scare the protagonists and characters in the movie, as well as scare the audience. But to acknowledge, those aren't the only way we tell stories about ghosts. Uh, here in the middle are examples of a whole body of storytelling where ghosts are used in romances. So some of you may have seen this 1990 film, if you're old like me, uh, starring Patrick Swayze and Demi Moore called Ghost, uh, which is a very romantic film. Uh, more recent 2017 film called uh, A Ghost Story, uh, which is a beautiful film about love and loss and mourning and what it means to kind of have lost a connection to someone you care about. Uh, and of course, there are lots of examples of movies and stories uh, where ghosts are used in funny, childlike, uh, silly ways. So uh, Tim Burton's film Beetlejuice, there on the lower left, uh, and the kind of iconic American uh, cartoon character, Casper the Friendly Ghost, who of course is not scary because he's friendly, uh, that began in 1939, uh, and this was the most recent movie in 1995. So there are lots of different ways uh, that filmmakers have used ghosts to tell different kinds of stories. Uh, my focus will largely be on the use of ghosts as frightening entities and to think a little bit about the cultural work we do when we tell frightening ghost stories. Um, so just to give you a sense of the stages of this talk, I want to first uh, begin by thinking a little bit about the development of ghosts in American cinema, really thinking about the early days of the development of cinema, uh, motion pictures, and how ghosts entered into the medium world 
of uh, film and filmmaking. Uh, second, I want to think a little bit about persistent themes across the hundred years or so of American filmmaking. There have been sort of persistent themes that have attached themselves to the way we use ghosts to represent or to tell stories. Uh, and then the third are to think a little bit maybe about some of the cultural implications for how at least American film uses uh, ghosts. Uh, so uh, as, uh, as my friend pointed out at the beginning, uh, some parts of this talk are derived from uh, the last book I had that came out uh, called A Place of Darkness, The Rhetoric of Horror in Early American Cinema. And there are just three things from that title that are, are, are worth kind of noting. Um, the first is that as a, uh, as a scholar, uh, my work is very much around the idea of rhetoric. Uh, and when I, when I use the term rhetoric, I'm really thinking about the way we use symbols to navigate the world, uh, the ways in which things like literature or political speeches, films, television, et cetera, become frames for making sense of the world and navigating and hopefully changing our world. So my goal is always to think about the symbols of motion pictures or uh, other, other mediums, but to think about how those symbols help us to make sense of the world, to navigate the world, the kind of cultural work they do. So my focus is very much on thinking about motion pictures and film through a lens of cultural history. Uh, the second is, of course, that most of my work focuses on horror. So that's why I'm going to focus today on scary ghosts. Uh, and the last is, uh, as I've acknowledged, uh, I'm very much a scholar of American culture. I've, I've always said uh, I don't want to study other cultures until I understand my own. Uh, and as of yet, I have not been able to figure out American culture. So while I enjoy global cinema in all of its uh, varied forms, uh, my focus here is directly on American film and in particular on the idea of the American horror film. Um, and indeed, uh, arguably, uh, the United States can claim some credit on creating the idea of the horror film or the idea of a specific genre of film dedicated to frightening audiences. Um, really the first time the term horror film appears uh, in uh, the popular press uh, and being used in the American context is in relation to the 1931 films, uh, Todd Browning's Dracula that appeared in February, 1931, and then James Whale's Frankenstein that appeared in November of 1931. These really are the first two films that start getting talked about or called horror films. Uh, and just to give you an example, uh, here in April of 1931, just a couple of months after Dracula was released, uh, Variety, a very popular uh, trade magazine uh, in relation to American popular culture and entertainment, has this headline, U, which stands for Universal Studios. So Universal Studios has the horror cycle all to itself. Uh, which was both a way of acknowledging that Universal Studios that produced uh, both Dracula and Frankenstein, uh, that Universal was creating a new kind of cycle of films dedicated to horror, uh, and also that all the other studios said that they were not interested in making horror films. And in fact, uh, in 1931, even Universal Studios said, uh, horror films won't last, it's a, it's a fad, we'll make a few horror films and it will go away. A hundred years later, they were not right. Uh, horror film has become really one of the dominant genres and most consistent genres in both American and I think increasingly global film. But while uh, the horror film as a concept, the idea of a type of film that we can make or that audiences will go to see with the specific purpose of being frightening or unsettling or terrifying emerges in 1931, it certainly is not the case that that's the first time scary elements or horrific elements appear in film. Uh, and in fact, horrific elements appear in film virtually from the very first moment that films are screened. Uh, so as, as you may well know, uh, the first uh, films uh, publicly screened uh, appear, uh, generally acknowledged appear in December 28, 1895 in Paris. Uh, the Lumiere brothers uh, screen a series of very short films uh, to an audience the first time people had seen uh, projected moving pictures. Uh, and these were, you know, not particularly exciting films. Uh, as some of you may know, uh, one of the films was called Workers Leaving a Factory. And the film, in fact, shows workers leaving a factory. Uh, another train, uh, another uh, film was called A Train Arriving at a Station, and it shows a train arriving at a station. So the very, very first films screened were largely designed just to show that they could be 
projected, right? It was, it was a proof of concept. But within just months, like literally months after the first uh, public screening of motion pictures, you get films focusing on horrific elements. So there in the middle uh, is Georges Méliès, uh, Haunted Mansion that comes out in 1896, literally months after the first projected motion picture. And it is rapidly followed by hundreds of films that use some aspect of the supernatural, often ghosts, occasionally witches, devils and demons were very prominent, monsters of all kinds. So here we have a terrifying uh, ghost from uh, Segundo uh, de Chimon's um, The Haunted Hotel. Here's a vision of hell in the infernal cakewalk. This is Georges Méliès' very early attempt at a mummy film called uh, The Mummy. Now, one of the reasons that early filmmakers were drawn to uh, the supernatural, uh, to ghosts and spirits and magic, uh, was that many of these early filmmakers began their careers as magicians. Uh, in the 19th century, stage magic illusions uh, were very prominent. Uh, and Georges Méliès, for instance, was uh, the uh, owner and uh, director of the Théâtre du Robert Houdin, uh, which was a well-known magic theater in Paris. Uh, and there you can see an early poster with the, the ghosts here and the devil's mansion and all kinds of ghosts, uh, illusions and tricks. And in fact, stage magic was filled uh, with imagery drawn from the supernatural, from uh, folklore tales about ghosts, from devils, from all kinds of uh, focus in that way. And so my kind of first point, I guess, uh, in this talk is to think a little bit about the way early film relied on these folklore tales of ghosts uh, and specters and spirits. Part of that was that many of the early filmmakers, as I said, were stage magicians. So they were used to making illusions, to make things look like ghosts were appearing. But the other overarching reason uh, that early films uh, were so filled with ghosts and spirits uh, was that these films were very short. So if, if you haven't watched a lot of very early, you know, 1890s, early 1900 uh, silent films, uh, they were very short, maybe a minute, maybe two, maybe three minutes long. Uh, there was obviously no spoken dialogue. This is the silent era. For most of those early films, there was no music. Uh, and there was also no titles like you have on, on PowerPoints today, uh, where you have uh, a text explaining what's happening. The early films didn't have any of these. So to tell a story in three minutes with no speech, no music, no language, often required filmmakers to rely on existing knowledge of the audience. The, the, so they used stories that audiences already knew because then the audience could fill in the gap, right? Uh, so early films are filled with uh, fairy tales. They're filled with prominent historical incidents that everybody would know uh, the story of Abraham Lincoln or the story of Joan of Arc. Uh, everybody would know uh, the story of the crucifixion of Christ. At least every European and American audience would know these stories. And so when they saw a film depicting something, they could fill in the gap. They kind of knew who the players were, what was happening. They could, they could provide the narrative coherence to a film that often was very fragmentary in its presentation. Where this becomes particularly relevant for our discussion about ghosts and the way ghosts enter into a popular American uh, and global visual culture uh, is a peculiar uh, moment that occurs right around the time uh, that motion pictures are first emerging. And that is the uh, growth in America of interest in what is called uh, spiritualism, sometimes called American spiritualism. Uh, some of you may know a little about this, but let me uh, tell a little of the backstory. Uh, the, the birth of American spiritualism starts in 1848 with these two young women, the Fox sisters, uh, and they actually just lived uh, just a few miles from where I live now in upstate New York in a, in a small town called Hydesville, New York. Uh, and one night in 1848, uh, the sisters reported to their parents that they could hear a mysterious knocking sound uh, and that the knocking sound would respond to their questions. So they could ask a question and it would knock once for yes or twice for no. And they couldn't figure out, uh, so they said they couldn't figure out where this knocking was coming from. So the parents look around the house, they can't find a source for the knocking sound. Uh, they call the local priest. Uh, the priest comes, 
can't find a source for the knocking. The local sheriff comes. Um, this story of this mysterious knocking sound in Hydesville, New York, uh, and the Fox sisters uh, becomes quite nationally prominent. It gets picked up in newspapers. Uh, and in fact, later the Fox sisters and their father would go on the road. They had a stage show where they would go and tell the story of their mysterious haunting, uh, that their house was haunted by some sort of spirit. Now, odds are uh, this story might have just faded away into the plethora of examples of strange incidents or folk tales, except for the American Civil War. Uh, so as many of you may know, the US fought a civil war largely over the topic of slavery. Uh, the war pitted the North against the South. Uh, it was the single bloodiest uh, war in US history uh, with hundreds of thousands of Americans losing their lives. Uh, the trauma of the Civil War, uh, the widespread death uh, caused uh, across the country on both the North and the South, led to a dramatic interest in anything that could prove the existence of life after death. And so America in the late 1890s, early 1900s was filled with mediums and seances and any number of people purporting to contact dead loved ones. Uh, and there's a whole body of mechanisms they use to do that from uh, holding hands and uh, channeling spirits to spirit writing, uh, to recordings of uh, the voices of the lost, uh, the moving and manifestations of objects. Um, by the early 1900s, some 10 million Americans, and this is a very small population at that time, some 10 million Americans uh, purported to believe uh, in spiritualism. Now, what made American spiritualism different than previous spiritual beliefs, right? You know, because most uh, Judeo-Christian religions believe in some life after death, right? That people die and they go to heaven or they go to the bosom of Abraham or whatever it might be. The difference between American spiritualism and traditional American religious beliefs was that spiritualists purported to provide evidence of life after death. So where Christianity or Judaism believed that life after death was a matter of faith, spiritualists purported to provide proof that the spirit not only existed, but that spirits were manifesting somewhere in the world. Uh, this rapidly led spiritualism to become heavily involved with the technologies of visual culture. Um, and so there are hundreds and literally hundreds and hundreds of books published providing uh, detailed steps for how to go about conducting a seance, how to go about conducting, uh, to contacting a lost loved one. But the probably one of the biggest impacts was on photography. Uh, so this image here on your right uh, is, if you can see that, uh, you can see a, a, an elderly woman, uh, clearly a widow dressed all in black uh, with this sort of mysterious male shape behind her. Uh, this woman was Mary Todd Lincoln, the uh, widow of slain President Abraham Lincoln, the uh, president who led America through the Civil War, freed the slaves, and become a, became a kind of iconic cultural uh, saint for the United States. Um, this was purported to be a real spirit photograph, uh, and it opened the door for a whole host of spirit photographers who purported to use the new visual technology of photography to provide visual evidence of the life after death or visual evidence of ghosts and spirits. Now, the impact of beliefs about ghosts and stories about ghosts was not just impacted on uh, early photography, it was widespread. Uh, in American visual culture of the late 19th, early 20th century. One other example uh, that I think is germane uh, is the uh, prominence of what were called magic lantern shows, uh, or sometimes in my preferred term, phantasmagorias. Um, and magic lantern or phantasmagoria shows were basically PowerPoint presentations, right before PowerPoint. Uh, these were uh, slide projectors, sometimes using candles as light, that would project a glass slide, usually drawn on, onto a wall or a sheet. 
and they became a way of illustrating a story being told by some storyteller. Many of these stories and many of these slides focused on ghosts in part because of the ethereal visual nature of the projected image that seemed to resemble what spiritualists had told us ghosts would look like. So you begin to see how the growth of American spiritualism bleeds into visual technology and visual technology in turn bleeds back into the spiritual beliefs about ghosts and the afterlife. Uh, and so in the midst of this, spirit photography, magic lantern shows, American spiritualism emerges the moving picture, which arrives in America in 1896, just as all of these cultural forces, beliefs and technologies are at play. So not surprisingly, uh, many filmmakers, both American and Europeans, make films about ghosts. And if you look at some of these images, uh, they're using the exact same imagery of the ghost that the spiritualists are talking about. Ghosts appear as uh, black and white or faded figures. Uh, they are often shrouded in a white sheet. And so here we have, this is back to Georges Melies Haunted Castle. Uh, this is one of my favorite American films. It's a 1900 film uh, by Thomas Edison's studio called Uncle Josh in a Spooky Hotel. And here we see, if you can make it out, uh, the ghost with this kind of skeletal face shrouded in a white uh, robe or white shroud, uh, appearing and disappearing uh, to the consternation and terror of our protagonist, uh, Uncle Josh. Um, now, it was not lost on early film viewers that watching motion pictures had a kind of ghost-like quality. Now, here I want to quickly add one note. Uh, there is a popular myth that early film audiences were terrified by moving pictures. There is a story that says when people first saw the train arriving at a station, uh, that they were terrified, uh, that they thought it was really a train. Uh, that, there's no evidence that that's true, right? There's no evidence that any audience sat and watched a moving picture and thought it was real. Audiences were familiar with photography. They were familiar with magic lantern shows. So when people saw moving pictures, they knew it was a technological illusion. But while they weren't frightened, many reported feeling a kind of experience of the uncanny. Um, quite famously, uh, Max Gorky, uh, who is a Russian intellectual and journalist, uh, writes about uh, seeing the first projected moving pictures in Moscow. Uh, and he says, it is like entering a kingdom of shadows a place where ghosts and evil spirits cast entire cities into eternal gray slumber. Um, American author Alice Ricks uh, recalls seeing the first motion, uh, moving pictures and saying it was as if there was a mysterious beyond where awful shadows lived and moved in strange ways. Um, and indeed, many of the very first projected moving pictures were advertised in America as living pictures. So no one went to see a moving picture show and thought it was real. No one went to see a moving picture show and thought those were really ghosts or spirits on the screen. But they recognized, and again, here's where I think we see that through line from American spiritualism into visual technology. They recognized the kind of similarity, this kind of uncanny parallel between the experience of or the belief of ghosts and the experience of this strange, odd illusion of moving pictures on the screen. Uh, so as I said, cinema and ghost stories really went hand in glove. They were well connected. They were culturally positioned together at a moment when American uh, spiritual culture, religious culture, political culture, and technological culture all converged to put the ghost as a very central figure in American belief, and in American visual technology. So not surprising, uh, as I've suggested, there were hundreds, perhaps thousands of early films using something like the ghost motif. And that has not stopped. And so one of the things in thinking about this, uh, this panel and this uh, conversation uh, that I started thinking about uh, was the persistence of the ghost narrative from way back in 1896 all the way till today. Right? that we have consistently been producing motion pictures 
designed to frighten people using ghosts. And so one of the things I wanted to think about a little bit, again, as a scholar of rhetoric, who's always trying to think about the cultural work uh, that popular culture does, I wanted to think about what are the themes that have recurred across that history of motion pictures about ghosts? What are the themes, at least in American culture, that keep recurring that I think start to tell us something about the cultural work that ghosts or spirits are doing for us, at least rhetorically and symbolically. And I have three of those I'd like to share with you briefly here. Uh, the first is that at least in American culture, and certainly in American cinematic culture, ghosts are associated with guilt. Now I know in other cultures, uh, ghosts are often have a more guardian approach. They are family members. They come to uh, comfort us or guide us. Uh, but by and large, the predominant view of ghosts in American popular culture is that ghosts are a representation of our guilt. Uh, and so there are hundreds and hundreds of films that focus on a ghost as a manifestation of something a person did wrong earlier in life. Maybe one of the more famous examples uh, is this D.W. Griffith film from 1914 called The Avenging Conscience, uh, in which a young man uh, kills someone uh, and then is haunted by that spirit for the rest of his life. This is very much uh, similar to the literature of Edgar Allan Poe and this recurring idea that the crimes you commit do not go away, but their memory lingers with you. And in fact, uh, in American language at that time, in the early 20th century, the term haunting or haunted was often associated with the idea of guilt. Right. So it wasn't necessarily a ghost haunting you, but even just something you did, your guilty conscience would haunt you. And so haunting became associated with some sense of personal guilt or personal responsibility. Uh, and that theme has remained consistent uh, across American popular culture. Uh, that's the 1981 film I mentioned earlier called A Ghost Story. Uh, which tells the story of four old men uh, who are all guilty of a crime from when they were children and the ghost returns to haunt them into uh, guilt and, uh, and confessing their crime in later life. Uh, some of you might've run across this more recent film from 2000 uh, starring Harrison Ford and Michelle Pfeiffer uh, called What Lies Beneath uh, that is about a man's infidelity uh, and murdering his mistress and the ghost of the mistress returns to bring guilt and chaos to his life. Now, interestingly, in American culture, at least, this guilt is not always individual. But at times, the guilt we're haunted by is a more collective or corporate responsibility. Let me show you three examples very quickly, some you, you might have run across. Um, Stanley Kubrick's film, The Shining, which is one of the more celebrated American horror films, uh, about a haunted hotel. But at the root of the haunted hotel is uh, the idea that the hotel was built on a native burial ground. So a burial ground of Native Americans. And so the uh, sacrilege done, the desecration of that sacred burial ground by the construction of the hotel creates this corporate guilt, largely a guilt around colonialism and American expansion. Uh, Poltergeist, which is the film by Toby Hooper, produced by Steven Spielberg in 1982, has a similar theme, a house built on a graveyard, uh, but here it's not a native graveyard, it's just corporate greed. The company making the house was too cheap to move uh, the graveyard, and so they just plowed over it and built houses. So again, if there's a guilt theme here, it's a guilt of American neoliberal capitalism and its disregard for the lives and memories of others. Uh, and then this film uh, from 1992, Candyman, uh, which is a film about an African-American ghost who comes back to haunt people because of racial violence, again, suggests the kind of corporate guilt over our uh, uh, long history of racism in American culture. A second thing that's remarkably persistent that maybe you can already hear in the first theme is the relationship of ghosts and haunting to property. Now, again, in other cultures, ghosts are often connected to family, uh, but in America, they are much more commonly connected to property. Right. Owning a home is the best way to get a ghost. If you want a ghost, go buy a house. Uh, and so all the way back into the early 20th century, so 1912, uh, this Rex film called The Ghost of a Bargain, uh, this Lubin film from 2000, uh, 1914 called A Deal in Real Estate, are all about the idea that houses can be haunted and that haunting connects to uh, home ownership. 
uh, and that it's, the danger of owning a home is that you might buy a house that's haunted by ghosts. Uh, this theme expanded slightly in the early 20th century to focus on the relationship between ghosts and wealth. Uh, and so there are hundreds of films that begin with the conceit that in order to inherit money from your family, you have to spend a night in a haunted hotel or a haunted house, right? Uh, so this uh, Abel Gantz film in English called Help in French, Au Secure, uh, 1924, is about a man who must spend a night in a haunted castle in order to receive money that allows him to wed his beloved. Uh, famously, the 1927 film Cat and the Canary is about a woman who has to spend a night in a haunted house to inherit money. So you begin to see a theme, right? In America, ghosts and spirits and danger are associated with property and wealth. Um, this has remained a very prominent theme, certainly into the more recent uh, era. So here are three films from the more kind of modern era, the 1979 film uh, Amityville Horror, uh, the 2007 film Paranormal Activity, uh, and the 2013 film The Conjuring, all films about haunted houses. And here's an interesting theme that I think tells you something about American culture and its belief in ghosts. All three of these films have as a central conceit that the reason the family doesn't just leave the haunted house is that they can't afford to. In all three films, and in fact, a lot more, these are just three examples, a family buys a house they cannot afford, they are struggling to pay the mortgage, the haunting happens, and the reason they can't leave, they can't escape the ghosts, is that they cannot afford to sell their home. That is a good sense of the relationship between American view of ghosts and guilt and terror and this idea of property consumption and wealth. Third very quick example I'll touch on is the connection between ghosts and identity. Um, in American popular culture, the people most likely to be haunted by a ghost are women or children, but the person responsible for handling the ghost is usually a white male. White men, white father figures, white husband figures are overwhelmingly the characters brought into a haunted house film to face down the evil spirit. So here we have some very early examples, uh, the 1911 film on evil power, uh, the 1917 film, The Evil Eye. Both of these are stories in which a young woman gets wrapped up in spiritualism and mediums and ghosts, and it's her fiance who has to come rescue her. Uh, my favorite example uh, is a lost film from 1914 here. You see a still, uh, Cecil B. DeMille's film called The Ghost Breaker. Uh, the Ghost Breaker fe features an American protagonist named Jarvis. Uh, he falls in love with a Spanish princess. Uh, and in order for the Spanish princess to inherit her family's wealth and castle, she has to rid the castle of ghosts. Jarvis comes to save the day, and my favorite line in, in the entire silent era, someone says to this American protagonist, Mr. Jarvis, you can't go to the castle. It's full of ghosts. And Jarvis says, ghosts? Are you kidding me? I'm an American. Now that gives you a sense of the relationship between the terrors of guilt and haunting and the juxtaposition with a sense of privilege white male identity. And this is not something that goes away during the silent era. Uh, in the modern era, it persists. So back to that film I've talked about a couple of times, Toby Hooper's Poltergeist. Um, in the end, the person responsible for rescuing the family from the ghosts and spirits is this beleaguer beleaguered father. Uh, in the film Insidious, Lee Winnell's film to, from 2010, the entire film is about a father having to take responsibility and rescue his child from ghosts. And the last very quick uh, kind of example of this that I find quite fascinating is in very recent American popular culture. Um, the last decade or so, American television has been filled with reality shows about ghost hunters. And I, I don't know if this is a phenomenon happening in other parts of the world, but in America, there are dozens of television shows that purport to be reality shows following the adventures of paranormal investigators who go to haunted houses or haunted sites to haunted families and purport to investigate and protect the family 
from these ghosts. So these are supposedly real stories, but I want you to note the relationship between these cinematic constructions of the white male lover, husband, or father, and these ghost hunters. And so these are a couple of promotional stills from uh, Ghost Hunters and from Ghost Adventures. Uh, and they all feature these, you know, sort of tough looking white American uh, males in, in American culture, we would call them bros, right? So these kind of tough looking bros uh, out there with their scientific equipment investigating ghosts and haunting. And one of the things that you almost always see in these television shows is a scene where one of the ghost hunters will shout out into the haunted house, okay, ghost, you scared them. Why don't you come scare me? Which is an exact reflection of the 1914 film from Cecil B. DeMille, except here transported to 21st century American reality television. So you begin to see these persistent themes of guilt, of property and privilege all intersecting around the ways we construct the ghost as a kind of rhetorical cultural symbol. So in my last few minutes, I just wanna to touch on what I think is some of the implications uh, of this. And one that should be fairly obvious, but, but maybe it's, it's useful, particularly in terms of thinking about ontology and rhetoric, uh, is the ways in which ghosts consistently return to prominence in American visual culture and cinema culture in relation to major events that challenge our collective national sense of integrity, responsibility, and identity. We certainly see that with the rise of spiritualism and spirit photography in the aftermath of the Civil War, uh, where America was dealing with massive loss of life and property, a major challenge to its national identity, all in the midst of the Civil War. And so ghosts become a frame for thinking through the aftermath of this tragedy. How do we live beyond this moment that seems so cataclysmic? Similarly, the haunted house films in the aftermath of the First World War, films like Cat in the Canary, Seven Footprints to Satan, The Last Warning, all again, after massive loss of life, massive challenge to national identity, massive challenge to our sense of our place in the world. Uh, similarly, in the 1970s, in the aftermath of the Vietnam War, we had a remarkable rise in films focused on a house suddenly becoming strange and haunted, which I think echoes both the US experience of the loss in the Vietnam War, as well as the turmoil caused by that war domestically as Americans were involved in protests and internal wrangling over the efficacy or ethical nature of that war. Um, and I think you know one of the more interesting examples for me uh, partly because this is during my lifetime, uh, was the rise in prominence of haunted house films in the aftermath of September 11th. Um, and as an interesting, very quick story, uh, this film at the top left, this is uh, the film The Others, starring Nicole Kidman. Uh, this film had come out in American theaters in mid-August of 2001. And as most American films do, it opened fairly big and was beginning to slowly drop in the box office as people had, who wanted to see it had seen the film and, and it was starting to dwindle away. September 11th happens and a lot of studios uh, don't release films for a few weeks because they don't know if it's appropriate to release entertainment in the aftermath of, of a tragedy like September 11th. But this film, The Others, actually starts to increase in the box office. More people start going to see this ghost film in the aftermath of this national tragedy, the attacks of September 11th. And of course that opens the door for a whole host of films that also focus on the haunted house, the domestic space suddenly rendered strange and threatening. And so we see remakes of Japanese films like Dark Water and The Ring. And that has consistent, that's persisted uh, into the present day where we keep having haunted films like uh, uh, insidious, sinister, multiple conjuring movies, consistently playing out this idea of the haunted domestic space, the threatening spirit, and the need usually for a male father figure to take responsibility. So as a last point, I guess I'd ask the question kind of where next? Uh, and here I would note a very interesting phenomena that's been happening over the last five to six years, uh, and that is the rise of ghost stories on the internet. Uh, and here it's not just entertainment. These are often ghost stories that are purported to be real. Uh, so some of you may have heard of these, maybe not. This is actually a Japanese art figure named Momo. 
Uh, and Momo started appearing on YouTube uh, in videos that supposedly were aimed at children. Uh, and there was a widespread, in fact, kind of a moral panic about Momo showing up and terrifying children or convincing children to do dangerous things. And there were people who believed that this Momo was some sort of evil spirit that was infesting the internet. Um, some of you may have heard of this story. This is a, a, a creation, internet creation called Slender Man. Uh, and Slender Man is a series of images. Uh, but it became so prominent on the internet uh, that in uh, 2014, two teenagers believing Slender Man was real stabbed another teenager believing that murdering them would bring Slender Man to life. So this internet meme, this virtual ghost story, really picked up life uh, and pretty soon was being treated as if it was real. Uh, and then this last one is a 2017 internet Twitter story called Dear David, uh, in which the Twitter poster purported uh, that they were being haunted and they would post images and stories of this haunted house. Uh, and within months, this Twitter had a million followers, who, many of whom believed that this story was real, that this was genuinely a haunted house. And so it's interesting to see how the new visual technology of social media has also entered into this conception of ghosts, property, privilege, and identity. And if that weren't enough, in 2020, we had our first haunted Zoom movie, a movie directed by uh, Rob Savage called Host. That is, maybe this is dangerous to say during a Zoom call, it is about a haunted Zoom call and what happens to the people who invoke spirits on the internet. So all that's to suggest that I think globally, uh, America has contributed some interesting dynamics to the way we think about haunting and spirits, particularly the relationship between ghosts culture, and technology. So I thank you for this opportunity to talk, and I look forward to hearing what other people have to say. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, um, Dr. Phillips, for this uh, amazing talk. Um, okay, so while we wait for the questions, I mean, anyone can write um, in the chat box. Um, I have a few um, questions myself. Um, so, so anyone can write in the chat box or switch on their switch on their video. Um, so, Dr. Kendall, I think I think let's start with the uh, with the most basic question, which I always had as a as a horror fan. Um, you know, uh, what is this? You know, how do we understand this propensity towards uh, you know this this getting scared? You know, you know why do we like to get scared? That's number one. Because you know, I I, I have my father always telling me, you know, why should I pay and get scared? You know, you know where he, I know where he's coming from. You know, uh, but but how do you how do you uh, negotiate that kind of thing that I go and you know I pay and I get scared? Uh, honestly, that's what I find most interesting about horror because you're right. It, it, horror is the one genre that says, "Pay me money, and I will show you things you don't want to see." And, and if a horror movie is really good, uh, you'll hide your eyes, right? You know, so why would I pay money? For something I don't want to see. I, I think there are you know, probably a variety of reasons. Certainly there's a kind of thrill and excitement. Um, but for me, as, as a scholar interested in rhetoric and culture, um, I think horror provides a place for us to work through the very real anxieties in our culture. I mean, the world is a scary place. You know, even pre-pandemic, the world is a scary place where scary things happen. Um, and we're in a culture, especially an increasingly rapid global culture, where the world sometimes seems unpredictable and dangerous. And so cinema, just like folklore or mythology, provides a symbolic space for thinking through those dangers, those risks, those terrors, so that it helps us kind of make sense of uh, those issues. And not just our fears, but also helps us make sense of who our monsters are, whether they're ghosts or demons or killers, uh, and think about that process of constructing things as monstrous and what that means to us as a culture. So I rely on a kind of sociological or cultural approach. Um, also the way uh, a ghost is supposed to look, and you said that it's a post-Civil War, post the, what the Fox sisters uh, saw, and they described what the ghosts were uh, like. So. Do you think it comes really from that? But uh, don't uh, the folk tales or the fables have a role to play in that? Oh, absolutely, yeah. The, the the idea that ghosts were shrouded comes from funeral shrouds, right? The, I mean, so you're as you're absolutely right that there are lots of cultural traditions that film picks up on. So I don't necessarily think film created those traditions. What film did and the visual technology of the kind of 19th century, they solidified it and popularized it. 
So they took this particular view of the ghost as shrouded in white uh, and translucent and made that ubiquitous. So that now I will say, you know, when I look at Japanese ghost stories like Ringu or Dark Waters or, or those films, their ghosts, they're, they're unique Japanese ghosts, but they look very much like the visual grammar of American spiritual photography and American film. And so I think that's what American film did is it took those folklore beliefs and turned it into a visual template. And you can play with that, you can adapt that template, but it solidified this idea of the ghost as, as occupying a particular kind of ephemeral, shrouded, uh, black and white vague space. Also, also, uh, do you find a kind of difference between a kind of community watching inside a theater and watching it all alone in your house? Sure. No, I think a big part of, uh, you know, the horror film's appeal has been its collective viewing. I mean, it's certainly more fun. There's a wonderful, you know, waves of affect that roll. Same with comedy, right? Comedy is much funnier when you're when you're in an audience and you feel the wa laughter wave rolling across the audience. And even if I don't think it's funny, I'm likely to laugh just out of the contagion of those affective waves. Um, and it's also certainly the case, at least you know, again in American culture, uh, that seeing horror movies, uh, especially for young people is almost a kind of rite of passage. It's a kind of initiation process, right? So we all go see the scary movie together to prove we're willing to see the scary movie. So I think you're absolutely right. There is something very collective about the viewing of horror films, though it's interesting to see how that is changing as we are shifting really, maybe temporarily, maybe permanently to a more isolated focus. And so I think films like Host, if people haven't seen it, I, I recommend giving it a look. Um, Host is I think trying to play with that idea of isolation and viewing and how that's a different experience than collective viewing. But I, I think you're exactly right. Um, also, also personally, I think, you know, uh, horror films is one genre which scores over novels because I think ghosts are very visual dependent, you know, on the visual medium. Do you think novels have, um, you know, can reproduce that kind of effect? I, I honestly, I, I think ghosts and film are made for each other. I really, I really do think there's, there are things you can do in cinema and particularly after the introduction of sound. And, and, what, and one of the reasons I think the introduction of sound was so crucial in creating the conditions for horror to become a genre is that it is very visual, but it's also the ability to create sounds off screen, right? So you can see this, but if you hear something creaking just over there, it, it forces you as a viewer to scan the visual horizon and say, what, where did that noise come from? Where did that noise come from? So that ability to play, and again, if we're going back to ontologically, to play with image that's there but not there, sound that's there but not there, the, the, the pr epistemological pressure on the viewer to try to determine what is that sound? Where did it come from? What is that thing? Uh, is it real? Is it not real, et cetera? All those kind of ontological, epistemological games become part of the pleasure of horror, but also part of what makes it so terrifying because it really does strike at some of those core uh, aspects of the human condition. And perhaps my last question is, uh, you know, you did raise the point, you know, why is the, why is the woman always, you know, the victim and the survivor? You know, I, I, you know but she's the one yelling, uh, but hardly you find a man doing that thing, you know, hardly. Yeah. Well, so I think, again, this is another instance where at least, you know, in, in the American context and, and other folks from other countries may have uh, brilliant insights, but in America in the 19th century, there was a, a real religious and cultural belief uh, called the cult of womanhood. Uh, and the idea was, it's kind of a theological slash political idea that since women gave birth, they are closer to God. And by virtue of being closer to God, now look at the way this works politically. By virtue of women being closer to God, we must protect them from ugly things like being able to vote or own property <laughs> or, or, or live on their own, right? So they, they, because they're close to God, we have to protect them. Now, so obviously a lot of uh, misogyny and patriarchy driven through this cult. But the other aspect of it was the belief that if women are closer to God, they are also more tied into the spiritual world. So it's absolutely true uh, that in spiritualism in the American 19th century, the vast majority of mediums uh, or you know, spirit connectors were women. Uh, and in fairness, there are a lot of people that say uh, women were uh, given a chance to be performers by spiritualism. Women couldn't really be a magician 
So you know, pre-spiritualism, if I contact the dead, I'm a magician and it's a trick. Post-spiritualism, if I contact the dead, it's real. And that opened up a space for women to become kind of cultural performers through this use of uh, the, the cult of womanhood, the idea of sacred womanhood. Same is true with children. Um, with that kind of belief that children, their naivete and their innocence makes them more connected to the real world. It's us, it's us men uh, who are out there in the real world who get detached, which is why the resolution of many ghost stories in haunted houses is the man coming back and reasserting uh, authority, right? You know, ghost, get out. I'm here. I'm the man. I tell you to get out, right? Which is, you know, again, horribly patriarchal. Uh, and oppressive, but tells you something about the notions of identity and privilege and how those relate to culture. Right. So we have uh, a question from Vijay Raj Kumavat. Um, so he says, um, ghosts, despite not being there, have physical, mental, or real impacts on the non-ghosts. I think human beings, he means. So um, uh, he says, you know, how to consider this reality of the non-being of these ghosts? Sure. And this is, I think this, it's exactly that absence presence. I mean, I don't want to dive all the way down the dairy dar rabbit hole here, but we can certainly play around the edges of it. Um, it, it is exactly that absence presence uh, that plays out in the cinematic frame. So as people are getting familiar and comfortable with the kind of epistemology of cinema as a kind of optical illusion, but that we take for real and we connect to, I think the ghost, watching a ghost story is kind of a meta experience, right? I'm watching people see an optical illusion or a non-being entity. And I'm watching in, this, in the story, people see the ghost. The ghost is not there, but has the effect of being real. And I, as the viewer, am watching people who are not there, but having the effect on me of being real. So it's a kind of a, a mirroring of that experience uh, that plays its way out. I also think one last quick point on that is it, this also parallels, and this is where I think some of those ideas of guilt uh, play out, this also parallels our experience of memory, right? So when we remember, we are presenting what is absent, right? If I think about my dead father, I am recalling the image or experience or feelings of an entity who is not there. So to, to be in memory, to be in a state of memory is to be in this odd liminal space between present and past, present and, and absence. And in the midst of that kind of odd uh, phenomenological position, I find myself feeling things that are no longer here, right? So I feel uh, things about my dead father, even though my dead father's not here and has been gone uh, for years, right? So I think wrapped up in that is aspects of the human condition, perception and memory, perception and visual culture, and then presence and absence. So we're playing out those kind of core experiences from our memory to our experience of ghosts to our watching of the cinematic ghost, all kind of mirroring each other and becoming a kind of odd cultural space where we play between all of those experiences. Um, so we have another question from Upasana. It's a very interesting question. He, uh, she says, um, is there a scope of connecting the presence of ghosts uh, with the concept of dimensions? Sure. I mean, yeah, yeah, I think, I think absolutely. You know, early spiritualist literature uh, kind of presented this idea that ghosts live on a plane of our reality, but not our reality. Um, and with that, and again, I think that's one of the things uh, that spiritualism contributed that was a little different, at least than Judeo-Christian theology, in which the, the spirits live there, wherever, you know, wherever that is, or maybe they live down there, if the case may be, uh, but they live elsewhere. Uh, spiritualists created this idea, or, or, or at least uh, popularized this idea, that ghosts live with us, around us, just in a phase of existence that is different than ours, which opens up all kinds of fascinating thoughts about not only memory, but also our relationship to the past. Again, American, and I'll call this modern enlightenment culture, because I think it's not just American, this waves everywhere. Modernist enlightenment culture is based on the idea that we leave the past behind, right? So the, the, the endless narratives of progress are all about, we learn from the past and we leave it. We learn from the past, we leave it. So it's interesting that at precisely the moment in, in at least European culture, when this is becoming the zeitgeist of the moment, you get the rise of Gothic literature. Gothic literature becomes the kind of shadow of the enlightenment. The enlightenment says the past is past, forget it, we're progressing towards a future. Gothic literature says, no, no, no. 
The past does not stay past. The, past, the dead don't just go to some other dimension. They stay here. They stay parallel to us. They're watching us. They're judging us, which is a very, which is, you know, which is an, a, a theological position shared by uh, many in, uh, say, African cultures or Latin American cultures. There are lots of cultures who believe uh, in China and Japan that the dead of our, our ancestors stay with us. But European enlightenment said, no, 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 all that's past. We're moving on. It was the rise of Gothic literature and then American spiritualism that brought those past dimensions back to parallel existence with where we are now. So we have two last questions. Uh, so one is from Indro who says, uh, do you think that the success of the horror genre rests on the assured resolution at the end? Uh, no, uh, it, it, I cert that certainly was the case. Um, there was, you know, up until the 50s or 60s, uh, there was absolutely the sense that uh, the, the horror gets resolved. Uh, and so you watch the end of any, and it's interesting actually, just to tie back, the end of many uh, horror films of the classical era, so the 30s, 40s, and into the 50s, uh, didn't just end with the monster dying, but they ended with the happy couple going off together. So if you get a chance to go back and watch uh, Dracula, uh, the end of Dracula is not just the vampire getting the stake through his heart, but it's the, the fiance and the beloved walking up the stairs together into happy, holy matrimony. So it was all about the family. It was all about bringing resolution. But starting in the 60s and 70s, at least in America, there was the idea that the horror didn't end, right? That things were not going to be resolved. So I absolutely, it, there's some level of resolution, but it's interesting how many horror films in the modern era end with the door being left open. The ghost may be gone for now, but you know, which both creates a sense of paranoia and a dangerous world and the conditions for a popular sequel. Because let's be honest, Hollywood is all about making the money. Okay, so the last question is from uh, Keshav Bansal. Uh, he says, in some horror films, particularly depicting uh, those depicting exorcism, uh, there are often contestations of spiritual occultism and psychological reasoning to explain and categorize the possessed, which is, uh, you know, a woman most of the time. So what are your views on this spiritualism versus science aspect? So I think I think this is a fact. I think this is uh, this we could talk about forever. So I'll, I'll be quick because I know that you've got other wonderful speakers. But I think it it, it really is uh, tied into that particular moment uh, of American spiritualism because, and again, we could talk about this a lot more. American spiritualism framed itself not as a theology or a superstition or a folklore or a cultural belief. It framed itself as science, right? So so early spiritualists said they were scientists of the afterlife that they were here to prove it as a scientific fact. And so you get endless efforts by spiritualists and seance and mediums to prove the existence with film. Uh, in fact, the early uh, experiments with telegraph and radio had ties into spiritualists who thought they could use the radio waves to contact the dead. All these sorts of things are embedded in there. For, for decades, American culture kind of pushed that down, sort of saying, no, 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 spiritualism is nonsense, science is real. But if you go back and look at the, the reemergence of horror in the 1930s, uh, it is often predicated on the idea that science is too limiting, right? That scientific views blind us, that we don't see the spiritual. And so this is one of the recurrent themes, particularly around white male protagonists uh, in so many haunted house films. The ghost is there. Like things, you know, things are mysteriously floating. Like, and I saw some people in the chat, that red X on my screen, I honest to God have no idea where that came from. <laughs> I did not put a red X on my screen. I looked over at that and I thought, I think someone's messing with. So I may have to re, I may have to change my attitude about there not being ghosts because I have no idea where that little red X came from. Honest to God, no idea. But there's so many films in which evidence of the ghost is clear, right? Things are moved. Uh, people are acting strange but the, the white male father figure or authority figure refuses to see it, refuses to see it until finally they have to see it. And I think that goes back to that uh, American spiritualism, back to Gothic literature that says, as much as you think your science will save you, as much as you think your rationality will protect you, there are more things in heaven and earth than are contained within your science. So don't get cocky. And I think that may be, maybe that's a good route for all of us, particularly in the pandemic. Don't get too confident, right? Keep your eyes open. Okay, thank you so much, Professor Phillips, for your absolutely illuminating talk and responses. Thank you so much. Thank yeah. you, my pleasure. Yeah. Okay, um, so can we have uh, our next speaker, uh, Professor Martin Hudson? Yes. 
Um, so our next speaker, um, Dr. Martin Hudson, teaches creative and cultural practice at Northumbria University. Uh, he's the author of eight books, including histories of slave ships, Greek mythology, ghosts and haunting, histories of capital, and a forthcoming book on world making and uh, social theory. It's coming from Rutledge. Uh, he runs uh, the ERIS uh, seminar at Baltic 39 Gallery in Newcastle and worked for many years around projects with refugee and migrant communities. He is uh, the strand lead uh, for decolonizing research at Northumbria and his work combines creative practice, academic research and social activism. Uh, Professor Hudson has named his talk, uh, Ghosts and the Return of the Dead of World History. Over to you, Dr. Hudson. Great, thanks. And it's a, it's, a, it's a real privilege to be here with you and your students. It's um, a wonderful opportunity for um, a kind of set of engagements and conversations between us all about our kind of obsession with haunting um, and ghosts. And I just have to commend Kendall just for a wonderful um, tour through cinema. And uh, in many ways, I agree with so much of what kind of, kind of Kendall said there. I'm, uh, I don't have a presentation. This is more of a ghost story. Um, uh, rather than um, uh, a formal academic presentation. I just want to share one um, particular image. I hope you can see that. Yes, it's visible, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> so this sort of sense of um, where I, I'd like to begin really is um, in that moment where Kendall, Kendall ends. Um, uh, I want to think about the Enlightenment, um, um, and also to kind of reshift uh, the geography from the United States to uh, England broadly to the English ghost story. I wonder uh, and have been wondering over the last few days as I was coming to meet you all um, about why we're so obsessed with haunting and ghosts, why we've had an obsession probably throughout the history of humanity with the return of the dead why we constantly go back to locate um, uh, uh, what Derrida and Kendall mentioned Derrida, uh, the archival gesture of the dead, uh, why we go back to dead archives. What is it about haunting houses, uh, haunted houses that we find so compelling? Uh, and not just in the visual aspect, but also in the sense of what's that sound um, coming from in that, inside that locked room? What's the knock? Uh, coming from the floor, uh, what are the signals of the dead um, and of those who are beyond the boundaries of the living, perhaps across permeable walls and different dimensions. Um, but I also want to kind of say something which is perhaps in contradistinction to Kendall, that I do believe uh, in the return of the dead. I do believe that ghosts have an active living presence. And I don't believe in ghosts in any kind of traditional mythological sense, but I think the lived experience of the ghost is something amazingly powerful. And making the dead walk again, the revivification of the dead, making them live again, is about social practice. And this is why I'm a sociologist. I'm interested in the social effects and the social practices of ghosts, not necessarily just in their rhetorical and performative aspects, but what the ghosts do for us and what actually they're trying to tell us. What are the signals, the warnings, the revengefulnesses of the dead, but of which we have to take note uh, in our present ecological um, political, economic and viral catastrophe. So the social practices of the ghosts and what they're doing for us and with us and indeed amongst us is something that can tell us something about our human catastrophe and crisis. I'd like to kind of first think about this sense of what, why, why I came to the ghost and the dead. I was raised in a family of ghost believers, my great Grandmother was a spiritualist medium, um, and that was inherited by my grandmother. So my childhood was full of the dead and the revivification of the dead. My, uh, uh, my great grandfather had died in 1968, a year before I was born. Um, he lived still um, when I was a child in one room in my uh, grandma, great grandmother's cottage. Even though he'd been long dead, he still visited there. He 
um, um, uh, had a, an aspect of visitation to my great grandmother all the time. And I used to go looking for him behind the curtains, um, you know, to find him and try and talk to him. You know, so my childhood was full of um, um, these kinds of revivifications, the return of the dead, the revenants uh, of world history returning to us. Um, and of course, many of us were compelled as children by poltergeist stories. Um, and, and I'm not going to say so too much about poltergeists, but it says something about really our cultural and perhaps even sexual trauma um, that we have these revisitations of these kinds of spirits and formations. I want to refocus to England because I'm looking out of the window towards the moorland and not far away from me here is... Um, the site of Emily Bronte's Wuthering Heights. Indeed, if I moved up to the hill just beyond here, I would be able to look over the Vale of York um, to that haunted place. And I want to move through, I suppose, from Wuthering Heights onwards, a set of ghost stories and ways of thinking about ghostly practices that can help us think about our current uh, social crisis. I want to begin with this question of enlightenment again, because in many ways, Perhaps our foremost enlightenment and scientific thinker is, um, is Karl Marx. <clears throat> and Karl Marx, as Jacques Derrida rightly point out, pointed out in his book, Spectres of Marx, um, Marx, even though he was an enlightenment thinker, he was committed to uncovering the truth of history, he was committed to science, the science of society, and indeed the science of historical materialism of the future. He was very future oriented, and took his signals from the future rather than the past. But Marx was resolutely obsessed with phantasms. Even in his early works, like the German ideology, he was obsessed with finding phantoms and dispelling them, thinking about ghostly practices, turning the world upside down to really shake out this sense of where the phantasms were coming from. And he would then replace these phantasms with the real, with reality, the lived experience of uh, political economy. But Marx later in um, a piece called The 18th Primaire of Louis Napoleon said this, and I'll just read it out to you as a quote, men or humans uh, to non-gender make their own history, but they do not make it just as they please. They do not make it under circumstances chosen by themselves but under circumstances directly encountered, given and transmitted from the past. And here's the great phrase. The traditions of all of the dead generations weigh like a nightmare on the brain of the living. So the traditions of the dead generations weighing like a nightmare on the brain of the living. And we see this in Kendall's account of the ghosts of American cinema, don't we, and European cinema, that constant, bringing to birth of that sense of the dead returning to us time and time again. As Marx says, we wrap ourselves uh, rhetorically in the battle flags of the past, the motifs of the past. And why do we constantly return to this sense of these different dimensions and the ghosts breaking through the membrane of the land of the dead? Perhaps we can call it Hades in European Greek antiquity, breaking through to the world and the land of the living. And part of the reason my great grandmother was a spiritualist medium is that much like um, American spiritualism, uh, spiritualism in Great Britain um, was in large part formed by the experience of the First World War. Uh, and particularly also the influenza um, crisis that followed the First World War. Uh, we're talking about millions of dead across Europe, many soldiers who did not return um, to the land of the living, uh, Jeff Dyer, who perhaps I'll mention a little bit later, wrote a book called The Missing of the Somme, where he talks about the 80,000 people in the Battle of the Somme whose bodies didn't even return. So they were literally turned, as he says, into he stood on the plains of the Somme as a rider looking at the battlefield and he sees the butterflies rising off the field and he sees the psyches and the souls of the, the hundreds of thousands of dead of the Somme. These were people whose bodies were not returned to us, disembodied presences, and constantly throughout the 1920s, spiritualist churches in Great Britain, and including my great mother, great grandmother as a medium, were trying to contact those dead generations of the people who've been lost to us. 
So there was a radical compulsion to deal with that particular viral crisis and warfare by revivifying, making the dead walk again um, as revenants amongst us to try and find out what their ultimate fate had been on the battlefield and what could they tell us as words of comfort to their mothers um, about the world that they were now residing in, existing in, beyond this human lived world. So this sense of the spectres of the dead is, is a fascinating one because it performs all kinds of different spectral and social practices. John Berger, the art historian, often wrote of the dead. In fact, he was obsessed with the dead um, and particularly the dead of the peasantry, the ways in which peasant life would be reformed and reformulated. But he was constantly talking about the rising of the dead, the memory of the dead, and the dead as a presence to us. And that was partly because as a young man, he'd lost a friend who died young. And this friend returned to him time and time again as a presence, not necessarily in corporeal form as a ghost or even a ghost dressed as a shroud, but the memory of his dead friend uh, would come, it would warn him about certain courses of action and catastrophes. It would help him think through his relationships, his life. So the presence of the dead remained with him, uh, walking alongside him again as a spectral presence. Walter Benjamin, to, who was also recomposing Marx um, and who Berger um, took much from actually, uh, Walter Benjamin said, well, we can think about the future and we can think about our future social formations out of the catastrophe of fascism in the 1930s, of which Benjamin himself would not survive. And he said, well, actually, what we take as social practice is very rarely from the future, but much more often from the past. So Benjamin talks about the revolution being nourished by enslaved ancestors rather than liberated grandchildren. So enslaved ancestors rather than liberated grandchildren. So a sense of liberatory and emancipatory politics was shaped by that sense of the dead as continuing persisting presence with us. He talks in his great piece, the thesis uh, on the philosophy of history, uh, which incidentally, uh, you know, and I would urge you to read it, I'm sure many of you have, um, incidentally was saved by Hannah Arendt, um, who fled with the manuscript in a suitcase. Benjamin um, committed suicide rather than being caught by the fascists. Hannah Arendt herself escaped to New York, carrying the manuscript uh, of Benjamin with her, which she published many years later. And in this manuscript, he said it's an mysterious, enigmatic, a philosophical, mystical experience to read the manuscript, actually. He talks about even the dead will not be safe from the enemy if he wins. Even the dead will not be safe from the enemy if he wins. And this enemy has not ceased to be victorious. So the struggles around social practice and political formations and emancipatory futures are about the struggles over the dead and what the dead are trying to tell us. This sense of the dead is enmeshed fundamentally, as Kendall said, in this sense of cultural trauma. When we look, for example, at various sites, and I'm particularly interested in haunted houses and haunted landscapes, um, hence uh, uh, this book, Ghost Landscapes and Social Memory, where a lot of these ideas are extracted from. And it's given me to do this talk, a chance to kind of go back and revisit some of that, these ideas. This sense of cultural trauma um, is decisive for why the, the dead return to us. <clears throat> uh, if we think about the slave ship, for example, um, the slave plantations, you can even do uh, pieces of dark tourism. You can visit slave plantations or even American Civil War battlefield sites where ghost armies have been seen marching across the pastures. This uh, revivification of the dead, making them walk again, live again. We can see this in the histories of the Black Atlantic, uh, what I've called elsewhere the Zong Spectres, the Spectres of the Zong slave ship. The ghosts of the slave become present across the generations. It becomes a way of thinking about our oppression and our sense of liberation. 
the ghosts are warning us, particularly the ghosts of the dead who were thrown over the side of the, the Zong slave ship in the Atlantic. And in African Igbo culture, there was a sense um, in the early days of plantation slavery, as they'd been seized from their African homelands, in Igbo culture, if one died, uh, one returned to be born again amongst one's people. So it wasn't a sense of haunting so much that if you died, you would return. And in a terribly tragic set of accounts, what happened to a lot of the Igbo captives amongst the black American slaves was that they would often commit suicide en masse, having been made captive upon the slave ships or in the slave plantations. So the Igbo slaves would kill themselves by hanging themselves from trees um, as groups of people or throwing themselves over the side, chained uh, of slave ships, knowing fundamentally that they were going to be reborn back in Africa as children. So they would reverse that journey across the Middle Passage by terminating their physical human lived existence and would be reborn often as rogue, rogue souls. We often think about this as metempsychosis. The transition, the migration of souls from one territory back to another territory. This is a huge sense of a decisive cultural trauma of African-American slavery, which creates this sense of that resonance through the generations. That, as Kendall said, we actually we, we see in films like Candyman. The visitation and the revisitation of the dead amongst World War I sites, for example, and constant, um, even today, you know, the vision of phantasmic armies marching across the pastures or the visions of soldiers in death or uh, we're lying in our bed in an English farmhouse and our son returns to us at the moment of his death. Um, to speak to his mother um, as he passes over into the other world. Again, decisive moments of cultural trauma. This sense of passing and rethinking and that moment where we could not get a last message or a last signal to us become ways of presencing, ways of making real again and reliving that sense of, of being and a being that persists as a real presence amongst our lives, walking amongst us. Oliver Lodge, um, a famous writer uh, of the period of the First World War, wrote a set of books about his son Raymond, who'd been killed um, during the war. And Oliver Lodge writes these books, um, not just as testimony to his dead son, um, but because Raymond was coming before him and reappearing all the time. And not only was this an individual private message uh, delivered to his father, who was still in the lands of the living, it was a warning about the crisis of civilization and also a moment of comfort to let the people who were still alive know that the dead had their own world and that we, after death, would be able to revisit that world and visit our loved ones once again. So it was a moment of comfort in that sense of trauma. This uh, question of the walls and the permeability and the dimensions, the different dimensions of the jinn, we can see in Islamic cultures, for example, you know, where we have the jinn um, crossing over different worlds and different levels of hierarchy. <clears throat> and there's also that sense that our creative practice, whether it's theater or music or photography, can bring the loss to us. John Berger talks about this as photographers and artists being the clerks of the Forester's records. Um, nobody else is gonna keep these records and archives for us. You know, so the photographers and creative practice and theatre makers and filmmakers become the clerks of the records. Um, what Derrida calls the archons, the people who control the archives of our societies. One interesting case that John Berger brings before us is a, a book from 1967 about the doctor, John Sassel. Um, and this is in a book called A Fortunate Man. And, and I would urge you to have a look at Jean Moore's photography of peasant life in conjunction with the work of John Berger. Um, Sassel, the doctor, <clears throat> uh, ministered to, to, to his um, uh, people uh, in the Forest of Dean in the West of England. 
Um, and he was a, a clerk of the Forester's records in a sense as well, because he witnessed not just to birth, but to the death of the people in his community. And in many ways, um, his life became encapsulated in this book that John Berger wrote, wrote as a documentary analysis of, of the Dr. John Sassel with Jean Maul, uh, wonderful evocations of the pictures of, of people who were now lost and dead to us. So again, acting as the clerks of those archives and records. And what was really interesting in that history is that Sassel himself took his own life not long after this book, uh, precisely because he saw his life encapsulated, you know, within this set of archives and couldn't bear to be seen in such a manner. This sense of the kind of armies across territories is also fascinating. And over recent years, I've been thinking a lot about the spectral armies of the medieval period. Indeed, my next book is talking about the spectrality of Beowulf and Old English and the ghosts and the hauntings of the Anglo-Saxon period. <clears throat> um, but there's a manuscript called the, the Bydale Manuscripts. And the Bydale Manuscripts um, are a set of medieval manuscripts which testify uh, to the visitation of a series of ghosts during the Middle Ages. So Old Bydale was a monastery, it was an abbey, and around the territory of this abbey, it's around about 16 miles from where I live now, this abbey and the monks there collected stories of the ghosts who were visiting them. And what's really interesting is that these are actually the opposite of Casper the Friendly Ghost. Um, these are um, uh, ghosts which are very corporeal, very material, very physical, they don't turn up shrouded in a in a tablecloth. You know, they're not your airy fairy um, southern English ghosts. These are the northern English ghosts of Yorkshire moorlands. Um, and what was really interesting about these ghost stories is that they had real material effects in that society. So as people died, often if they died in unusual circumstances because of murder or accident or certainly uh, by their own hands, the people of the Moorland thought that the dead were literally going to rise and seize them again. They talked of them as ganganier, gangars, or walkers. There were people who were going to walk again, very much like zombies rather than ghosts, actually. And what this created was a culture in the rural area here in northern England of putting stakes through the hearts of the dead or the dead who died in unusual circumstances or even removing the head. And what would happen is that if you remove the head, uh, they wouldn't be able to find their way home again to haunt. So this sense of what you did with the corporeal, physical, material body had real social effects, you know, because they tried to uh, stop the dead returning to them rather than welcome that kind of revisitation. It was the reason why people who committed suicide were buried at crossroads, preferably a crossroad, not a four, but a five roads. And they would be confused and would find uh, the way they, w they wouldn't be able to find the way back home. So this sense of what the ghosts are trying to do in terms of social practices, I think is really, really fascinating. In some ways, uh, it's about revenge. <clears throat> uh, many hauntings are about this sense of revengefulness. Um, the taking revenge for something which has happened to them in life, that perhaps somebody has murdered them and got away with it. <clears throat> and uh, in the game, we saw that in Kendall's talk, you know, this sense of, uh, of punishment uh, that was going to be inflicted. It was a, a, a set of project-oriented ghosts, as it were, who were committed to social justice programmes to making sure that right was done uh, and not ill. <clears throat> so revengefulness is very much part of um, the reason why the dead returned to us, to revenge themselves upon the living, to commit acts of justice, um, and to, in some ways, right the cultural trauma. In some other returns and revivifications, what we have is the, the haunting as a warning or as a signal. Now, sometimes this is, as in uh, uh, Scrooge uh, and the ghosts he encounters in Charles Dickens' story, um, the ghost of Christmas past, the ghost of Christmas future. It allows the ghost to shape some sense of social future for Scrooge and the people around him, to turn him away from the path that he was taking 
which is towards the accumulation of money, the destruction of humanity and solidarity, the turning away of Tiny Tim, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so this warning or signal allows us, uh, the ghost, to avert us from social catastrophe. The haunting, again, is one about social justice um, rather than vengefulness and actually makes society better uh, for that intervention of the being from beyond. In some ways, this sense of the, the, the signal that the ghost is trying to give us is about the ghost being lost. And this is precisely when we think about landscapes and territories, about the ghost not being able to return home. Uh, or even to pass beyond the kingdom of the living into the kingdom of the dead, that they can't find the way there. And often those last acts of haunting are a signal that um, the ghost wants the help of the living to finally turn up in the land of the dead. There's something that has to be done, might be the burial of a body, might be the recovery of a lost coin. It might be a word of comfort that needs to be said to somebody. Um, that will finally allow the, the being to pass. And many seances um, or acts of exorcism are actually religious rituals which are designed to ease that passing of the dead from the world of the living. So the bodies of the lost um, are often incredibly insightful here because it might be that the body cannot be found, uh, cannot be buried properly with proper burial rites, and hence the spirit of the dead will persist in this world until the act of justice or rectification is actually made over the body. So that kind of passing is really interesting for the reasons why some spirits seem to linger in this world and in our culture. There's a social effect still to be performed around that. So the idea of what the ghosts are trying to do and perform in terms of their spectral presence is again a really fascinating question. One of my favourite ghost stories <clears throat> is a ghost story by Karen Blixen, Isaac Dinnison, who you might know from, uh, um, from out of Africa. <clears throat> um, uh, she wrote the kind of book about her experiences on a Kenyan farm. Um, but she wrote a set of ghost stories in Gothic tales, and particularly one set <clears throat> um, in Elsinore, in the town of Elsinore in Denmark. Uh, this is the, the ghost of, of Elsinore. And I just want to tell you a little bit about this story because it's probably the story that, that most obsesses me um, about the nature of um, uh, ghost stories. <clears throat> the ghost is Morton de Conning. <clears throat> and Morton de Conning, <clears throat> as a young man, left his sisters in their very privileged house um, just outside of Copenhagen in Denmark and went to become a pirate. <clears throat> and every now and then through the years, the two spinster sisters um, hear back uh, about Morton's dark doings throughout the world, his violence, his thievery, uh, the massacre of human beings. So these stories of piracy come back to them every now and then. And then for generations, uh, for, for some years, um, uh, they hear no more stories and suspect that Morton uh, is actually dead. No more stories come until one day a great storm uh, comes um, to, to Denmark. <clears throat> uh, and the sisters realise that Morton is in the room with them, but he's there as a spectral presence. He's called. He sits on the chair on the other side of the room. He doesn't speak. And in their fear, neither do they speak to him. He disappears in the snowstorm. The next night he appears, silence. The next night he appears, silence before them. He obviously wants to tell them something, to signal something to them from the land of the dead. And finally, they say to, um, to Martin, where do you come from, Morton? Just, just ask him, where do you come from? And they don't really want to hear it because they suspect that he's come from hell because that is what his actions um, have probably indicated to them from all the stories about him that had come back to Copenhagen. And Morton finally speaks to them and he says, 
I come from hell. But I can only come when the bay, the sound is frozen over. I can only come when the sea is frozen over because hell lies that way over the ice. So I can come to you uh, when the bay is frozen. And what happens is that Morton uh, disappears in the snowstorm back over the ice uh, to hell. <clears throat> and that strikes me as a, a really fascinating kind of analysis of the ways in which the, the, the ghosts return just for one final conversation. Um, and the reason is that they have to tell them something. And part of Karen Blixen's story is not for any apologies from Morton, um, but actually just to say to the Spinster sisters um, uh, that, that hell is there and hell is a presence. And this is your fate if you engage in these nefarious activities in the land of the living. Another favourite story of mine is from Raina Maria Rilke, um, in the notebooks of Maltids Brigger. It's not a, um, a big part in, in this particular book, uh, but the character is sat in a dining room. Um, <clears throat> uh, again, I think on the, on the Denmark border, actually, um, Germany, Denmark border. <clears throat> and um, he sat there as a child. It is Rilke himself, the great poet, sat there and there were about 12, 14 people having for dinner in, uh, having dinner in this winter night. And um, all of a sudden a door opens at one end of the room and a, a woman, a, a, a teenage woman, uh, walks from one end across the room. The room is in silence. Everybody sees this woman walking across. And the woman walks out the door at the other end of the dining hall. <clears throat> and this is... Uh, and he doesn't understand why everybody's gone silent and why hasn't this person been welcomed to the feast. And it's only when he realizes that the, 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 the girl, the woman is a spectral presence who comes every night through uh, the dining room, uh, that this is a visitation uh, from the dead. Other writers have talked about this sense of rogue souls. Jeff Dyer, who I've mentioned talks uh, about seeing the souls of the dead, as I've noted, in um, in insects and butterflies rising from, from what would have been the filthy plains of the battlefield. And in many ways, this is a retrospective visitation of the ghosts to those territories and places. But even at the time of the First World War, even on the battlefield as it was being fought, people talked about ghosts visiting. Uh, the ghost armies of Mons, for example, who joined apparently as ghostly presences, um, the armies of uh, <laughs> of Great Britain against the, the Germans. Um, and the battle was won precisely because uh, the ghosts had joined them. Others talked about spectral visitations of angels uh, upon the battlefield, which gave support um, to, to uh, one or other particular side. There's another fascinating story, which is recounted by Sigmund Freud in his own analysis of cultural trauma, where he talks about the spirit of a young girl walking across the ruins of Pompeii. And now a central protagonist in that story, um, it's the story of Gradiva, which actually Freud was really, really obsessed with. Um, he sees, the main character sees uh, this ghostly woman presence walking across the parade plains of Pompeii. Uh, and this um, uh, uh, ghostly presence uh, returns day after day. Um, and uh, our protagonist watches this ghostly presence walking across. But what's really fascinating about this walker um, is that she isn't a ghost, she's real, but she's encapsulated in the narrative of ghostliness uh, and the spectral, but actually she finally speaks to the protagonist and she's a real person. Um, so that sense of haunting isn't necessarily about the return of the dead. It's how we wrap our concerns and our traumas in some sense um, of possibility. The haunted house itself, away from the plains of battlefields or uh, the ruins of Pompeii, 
Um, the haunted house is a continual obsession. And again, Kendall pointed this out in terms of films like Poltergeist and of course, um, uh, films like the Amityville horror um, and the Amityville motifs, you know, which are incredibly scary, but obviously uh, in, in many ways fabricated. Uh, one of my favourites is P.G. Woodhouse's story, Honeysuckle Cottage, where the writer Rodman in, in, inherits his house from his, uh, inherits a house from his, from his aunt. Um, and uh, she is a sentimental um, romantic story writer and he's a hard bitten journalist writing thrillers and the miasma of romanticism starts investing his writing because of her ghostly presence within the house and he starts writing romantic um, novels and letters and actually falls in love um, so the ghostly presence is one that initiates him into sentimentality and romanticism I think it's an incredible uh, and, fu and really funny story um, and also, and not to do down Kendall and, and uh, our, our comrades across the, the Atlantic, but there's a wonderful story by Oscar Wilde um, called The Canterville Ghost, where there's a set of ghosts in an English stately home, and the home is bought by a group, a brash American family um, uh, with all of their new world sensibilities who are looking to live in a haunted stately home and castle. And the whole point of the story is the Canterville ghost trying to frighten the Americans. But exactly as Kendall says, you know, the Americans just like, like don't buy into this. You know, they just do not believe that, you know, old world ghosts are going to trump um, new world Americans. Um, so it's an incredible story about that kind of conflict between different kinds of social worlds and also spectral performances. Writers like M.R. James and Edith Wharton um, have expressed the, the, the sheer terror um, of the English ghostly experience and landscape. And for those of you who haven't read the, the, the ghost stories of, of M.R. James, I encourage you to do this. They're incredibly perceptive, incredibly frightening. Um, and it may be about the discovery of a lost book, maybe about an archaeological excavation, it may be about the being of a witch, um, in a tree, but M.R. James' terrifying stories of the English ghostly experience witness to that colonial and post-colonial trauma of Englishness and what the English inflicted upon the rest of the world, you know, that kind of mentality of domination, um, you know, which has, was becoming questionable in the 20th century, really works its way into that sense of spectral visitation. In a story by Edith Wharton called <clears throat> um, After, Afterward. <clears throat> um, a couple inherit um, uh, an English house um, uh, or buy an English house that the noise haunted <clears throat> and uh, the one who encounter the ghosts and the ghosts don't turn up um, to this house um, in the West country of England. Edith Wharton writes this wonderful evocation of this house. Until one day, her husband, um, Edward, goes to the door. There's a ring at the doorbell. And Edward goes to the door and she sees this almost spectral figure talking to him. Um, and Edward uh, looks shocked as he's talking to this person. She can't hear the words. And Edward walks out of the house and walks down the lane away with this other person and never returns. And in this story, what she is experiencing is that sense that we all experience in ghostly activities and ghostly experiences and visitations, that the ghost itself is not seen directly before us, but is a phenomenon that we remember, you know, or we retrospectively say to ourselves, that was a ghost. We don't often say that is a ghost before us. What we say is, retrospectively, I have seen that ghost. And this story by Edith Wharton testifies to that experience because it's only afterwards, which is what the story is called, and in retrospect that she realizes that this was a spectral form that had returned to us. These arrivals are often from the past, but as in the Scrooge story, often arrivals from the future to signal catastrophe, maybe an oncoming rail crash, which Charles Dickens was, was, of course, obsessed with. And um, their signal catastrophe may avert us from catastrophe. 
in one of the oldest ghost stories in our planetary global culture, Odysseus, trying to find his way home to Ithaca, uh, decides to go down into the land of the dead um, to find the route map back home. And he encounters people in the land of the dead and he has to sacrifice um, his own blood um, at the doorstep to Hades before he can go down the steps into the dark world of the underworld. And some of the people he encounters there, he knows are dead. Um, Achilles, who is um, a rather upset that he, he's already dead. Um, he encounters Achilles there. He encounters members of his family there. Um, but because he's been so long getting home from the battlefields of Troy, there are others there that he didn't know were dead, um, like Agamemnon, um, killed by Clytemnestra, his own wife, um, in a brutal uh, manner um, in Mycenae. And he encounters people also there who were still not aware that the dead, but they're there in Hades. So struggling with that passage and transition from the world of the living into the world of the dead. There's a beautiful story called <clears throat> The Haunted House by Virginia Woolf. Very short story where she talks about this house where two lovers, a husband and wife, once resided below uh, the English South Downs in the shadow of the South Downs itself. And the husband disappeared from the house, went north, went west, uh, went across the world, never came back. Um, she died and as each century passed, and each century passed in this house, the lovers would return some days to meet each other in the house again, just to be together for a short time before being dispersed into the ether yet again. The persistence um, of loneliness. This picture uh, to conclude that we have here before us is a picture taken in the garden um, in the field around uh, the most haunted um, house um, in England. It's a place called Bawley Rectory. The house is gone now. Um, you can have a look at images. You'll find them on the internet of the, of the, of the rectory itself. Um, a strange set of experiences in the 20th century. This is a child or perhaps even a nun caught walking uh, through the garden, uh, the grass or the hairs being mown. And there we see emerging out of the wood and captured by the archives of documentary photography, the clerk of the Forester's Records, captured by photography, we see the transition, the passing across the landscape of this figure in the garden. We see uh, in the stories of Henry James, but also in Bawley Rectory, the spectral face in the window um, on the second floor or the third, third floor that disappears because we know there is nobody in the house. We know that that knock upon the door can only be a ghostly visitation because we know that there are no humans in the garden. Bawley Rectory was eventually demolished. Nobody would live there. Um, psychic investigators and ghost hunters of the 20th century constantly return to these houses and landscapes and moorlands of the kind of poltergeist and the spirit, the revenant, those who've been revivified for different kinds of social practices to do certain kinds of things to signal some sense of catastrophe. The moors where I reside, um, I often follow the tracks of the witches um, in documentary accounts of antiquaries who've talked about witch folklore and talked about the way that they moved from house to house and moorland to moorland and dale to dale down certain kinds of tracks. Haunted black dogs inhabit the moorland there. Stories of ghosts passing um, down lanes uh, shrouded with, with lime trees. All of these are the sonorities, the sounds, the hearings um, of these spirit forms that come back to haunt us. Um, but that's less interesting than the social effects and the kinds of social formations that the dead are compelling us towards if we would only listen. And I'll leave it there, thank you. And take any questions. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Hudson, for this extremely intriguing talk. Um, so, so uh, the session is open. The, the four, uh, you know, it's open for questions, uh, but I have a few myself. Um, so, so uh, Dr. Hudson, I would like to ask you uh, if uh, a ghost or or ghosts are linked to a kind of afterlife or 
uh, immortality in a very perverse sense uh, that you are not entirely disappearing, but surviving with this fearsome form. Yeah, I mean, it, it is a fearsome and fearful form, isn't it? It's a, um, this often the undead <clears throat> um, and the monstrous um, return to us to, to warn and signal, but also to comfort and to support our grievance. Um, to support our grieving and our grief work uh, for one another. Um, but to go back to the Enlightenment again, it was the Enlightenment that was precisely designed to wipe that out. It was designed to, to banish the world of ghosts. Um, uh, one of the great slogans of the French Revolution was, was death to priests and kings. Uh, and it was a banishing of old rituals, of ways of thinking about the world. It was a banishing of the dead that no longer would we be prone to the traditions of the dead generations. So that kind of sense of monstrousness was something that was gonna be wiped out by the luminescence, um, the enlightening of the world. And Adorno and Horkheimer later in a book, The Dialectic of Enlightenment, will talk about the radiation of the enlightenment throughout the world as a planetary civilization, but also that it radiated disaster. So I think that fearsome, fierce, fearful and monstrous form is uh, it's obviously enmeshed in the counter enlightenment in a challenge to enlightenment, but it's also warning us about the disaster of enlightenment itself, um, that it's taken us to the brink of ecological catastrophe, industrial collapse. Uh, and if we could only listen to those kind of monstrous forms yet again, it would avert us from that sense of, of collision and catastrophe. Um, also, at, at any given point um, in time, the number of dead would always outnumber the, outnumber the number of living. So, so do you think that, that, that the fear also comes from this, uh, the, the, the monstrosity of history and our inaccessibility to it? That the dead are history, I mean. Yeah, the dead are history. Yeah, I mean, it's, a great, it's just a great way of saying it, the historical dead, uh, the dead of world history. Marx talks about it as the conjuring up of the dead of world history. Um, why do we conjure up the debt of world history time and time again? To recompose the question, I mentioned in the talk the work of Hannah Arendt. Now, Arendt uh, remains for me one of the great thinkers of the 20th century um, in so many different ways. And, of course, ended up in upstate New York herself at Bard College, uh, not far from where Kendall is. Um, this uh, problem was recomposed by Hannah Arendt. She says it's not the passing of people from the world that is the real crisis. The problem is natality, it's the bringing into being, the birth of people into the world. Um, so this sense of natality, of bringing to birth, means that other people have to leave the world for those people to, to come into it. But what is the house and the culture by which we then civilise those people being brought into the world? So she recomposes the, the narrative as not about death and the dead, but about birth and that constant rebirth of human civilization, bringing with it all kinds again of social catastrophes. Right, right. And and do you think also uh, that's per, perhaps my last question? Uh, do you think that also the, the the problem is also a very subjective one, where uh, it's almost always linked with guilt and the coming back of ghosts? Yeah, I think it can be. I mean, it's an interesting one. I'm, I mean, I think of myself as. A, um, I mean, I, I'm a bit mischievous because in reality, I don't believe in the dead in the same way that, you know, as Kendall said, you know, I don't, don't believe in ghosts in that sense. But I do believe in the lived experience of ghosts uh, and the social practices and social effects of them. And just to give you a sense of um, a colleague of mine who is conducting uh, research into paranormal experiences, um, began with a typical enlightenment mentality that these things are fictions and fabrications and that these people are essentially deluded. He interviewed around about 400 people and he came to the conclusion at the end of it that bar a few of them who'd experienced ghostly experiences, most of them were telling the truth. Okay. Now, I said, well, surely they're not telling the truth because neither you or I, Rob, believe in ghosts. So how can they be telling the truth? And he says, well, they are clearly telling the truth to themselves. They clearly think that they've seen ghosts. Um, so that sort of sense of the rhetoric and the performativity of ghosts is one thing. And the way that we tell stories about our ghostly experiences to frighten one another. Um, but there is a substance to those hauntologies. There is a substance to those 
revivifications. Now, whether that's because of trauma um, or mental health problems or hearing voices, the hearing of voices as jo you know, Joan of Arc, for example, hearing the voices of the angels, this sense of sound and sonority um, is about tuning into different types of listening to the lands of the dead, perhaps as we did in Paleolithic cave art. The reason why cave art was so obsessed with caves was that these were the membranes, the thin membranes between the worlds of the living and the dead, that somehow you could reach the dead if you could only put red ochre on your hands and touch the wall. Um, so again, you know, that sense of the reality of these things is fascinating. And again, as part of that, you know, what do the ghosts tell us or the, the haunting experiences tell us? And there's a phrase that has often come up in kind of ghostly narratives, particularly associated with night terrors, which is a phrase which strikes terror into me when I hear it as part of a ghost story. But often there's a phrase that comes from the ghosts themselves, which is, <clears throat> I know who you are. I know who you are. Um, I have come for you. And that sort of sense of that phrase, you hear it in lots of accounts in different kinds of ways, that it's coming for you specifically, perhaps about your trauma or your guilt um, or something that needs to be witnessed about your actions and activities. And again, particularly activities that might signal trauma and disaster. Yeah, so uh, we have one observation from Chandana Bokshi, which I just converted into a question. So do, do you think that, that the fear um, that we feel towards the undead, do you think we inherit it as a part of collective uh, memory? Uh, like, you know, also, if we do not, you know, it is taught to the children that do not go into the dark and uh, there is a ghost and, you know, you know go to sleep or, there, there, you know, there'll be a ghost coming. So is it a kind of, you know, um, tendency that we pass over, you know, to the next generation? I mean, on the one hand, I mean, on the, on the one hand, you could take an explanation from from Carl Jung, you know, that this is part of the collective unconscious of global humanity. Um, when Carl Jung would come to write uh, or indeed publish the Red Notebooks, you know, the the Red Notebooks are full of these haunted experiences of spirits visiting him, you know, in all kinds of different ways, and were very much part of his lived reality of a psychoanalyst and somebody who was obsessed with the ghosts returning to him. I mean, I don't buy that, you know, in the sense of a global planetary human unconscious, but we have all kinds of social imaginaries that we inherit um, that are recomposed all of the time. So if you think one of the other things I'm really interested in is the lived experience of mythological beings uh, and have written quite a bit about Greek antiquity and particularly centaurs. Now we know that centaurs as hybrid beings of horse and human, there's no deposition in the archaeological record. You know, we've never found the the um, the, the skeleton of a centaur. Uh, we're probably not going to find. Um, but that's very different from the lived experience of what the centaur was to the to to, to antiquity and the the antique world of antiquity, as is um, uh, the world of many global religions, is inhabited by so many proliferating beings and forms of saints, demons, gods, lesser gods, all kinds of deities and divinities, naiads, um, wood nymphs, the spirit of the waterfall. This populace of the world is just teeming with ghosts and beings from the jinn to the centaur to the walking ghost of English moorlands. And why do we continue to, to have this as part of a cohabitation with the dead? This lived experience of the human amongst so many other beings is, I think, a signal to a, tra a trauma at the beginning of humanity, which is that uh, much as human beings were beginning to define themselves as human beings against other animals, particularly deer and the animals that they would hunt, um, they become obsessed with killing monsters um, and that which is not human. And I think that trauma at the beginning of kind of human culture and human existence persists within us, which is why we have to make reparations to those beings that we've dispelled from the world, including ghosts. Yeah, thank you so much for your observations, uh, Dr. Hudson. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah, no, thank you. It's a real, it's a real privilege. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, so now we go um, from, from USA to uh, UK and now back to India. So our um, last speaker for the day is um, Vipuro Gaesto. Uh, he has an MBA from uh, Jadavpur University. 
where he also graduated in economics. Uh, he has been working with boys and young men on gender equity and masculinity since 1997 through Praja, uh, of which he is the founder director. His work has been primarily focused on children, especially boys in difficult circumstances, including uh, it's children, children in uh, contact with the railways and the children in institutions. Uh, he currently works with the young people in 12 districts uh, to set up youth collectives that campaign for gender equity and intervene uh, during situations of gender discrimination and violence, including child marriage, child trafficking, and child sexual abuse. Um, he has been advocating for the restructuring of the custodial approach to the rights of children, adolescents, and other young people, and has been highlighting how recognizing the agency of children and their choice and consent can eliminate institutionalized stigma, discrimination, and violence against them. The title of his talk is The Hindu Imagination of Ghosts and Spirit. Over to you, Deepta. <clears throat> thank you, Oshiji. Thank you very much for um, inviting me over. And um, let me just tell you that since you've also been introducing me, that my entire take on uh, myth mythology, I want to put that into quote unquote, actually, I'll tell you why, uh, will be from my social work practice and my experiences. Because um, let's say how uh, this happened. So, a long time ago, when I first started working in a childcare institution, uh, boys were talking to me about the different ghosts that they had seen before coming uh, prior to also ghosts that infested those child care institutions. So one of these ghosts uh, that a child actually saw uh, before coming to the institution was uh, that he had woken up in, at night and had gone into the, the room in their cottage, uh, which was where they had their cooking utensils. And he saw a very old woman, uh, all white hair, um, scraping the food which had uh, rice in it. And there was no rice. And she was just scraping and scraping and scraping for some little bit of rice. And he told me he was seeing this was this ghost that visited uh, his house ever so often. And uh, for me, this was for the first time um, an interaction with, uh, you know, um, with a ghost, uh, which made me think of it in a different way. Um, later, when we uh, used, to, when I worked with children who were on the move, they were on the railway stations in India. They were on the streets with uh, no under no adult supervision whatsoever, and they would be taken to a hospital for surgeries for uh, small other treatments. They would often run away, and one of the reasons why they would keep running away uh, would tell me that there were ghosts in hospitals and that they would see those ghosts in hospitals and they want to uh, you know, stay the night there. And uh, there have been incidents of people actually tearing away their saline, uh, you know, the channels that were made and running away at night because there was a ghost there. And uh, I will um, be talking a little bit more also on the lighter side is uh, also that our social work takes us to a lot of places. Um, and we stay in a lot of hotels. And I think a lot of us have faced uh, haunted hotel rooms where um, you can't go to sleep at night, uh, where you have to keep the TV on, you have to keep the light on because there's something uh, really, really uncomfortable about the room. And then you find many of your colleagues actually telling you that, you know, I've been to the same hotel on work and I'm in the same room and the same thing happened to me. And of course there have been haunted offices. In fact, we've had to uh, some, you know, this became so big that this office was haunted and people could not stay there at night that we had actually to shift offices. So um, this was how ghosts came into our, into our social work practice. I would like to share uh, something on the screen. Um, and um, uh, a picture of, um, uh, of children who, uh, have been um, okay. Yes, uh, this is a picture of a boy, and I will be showing some pictures of children with due permission from them. Um, they were depicting their fears in an exercise that we had with them, and every time that they were sort of imaging the 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 the, the fear that they had, they were actually uh, drawing pictures of ghosts, and they were actually recounting incidents in their lives uh, 
which were which was about ghosts about ghosts that they had not seen about ghosts they had seen about ghosts they had heard or the apprehension that they would come in uh, touch uh, with uh, uh, ghosts so um these are pictures of uh, children who were visualizing ghosts. You can see a lot of it has been influenced by cinema, um, as you see a lot of the way they are they have expressed themselves. And uh, this uh, that's me. I'm not a ghost, but the other other one on the side. Uh, so you see a lot of the fears that they were actually um, expressing was about uh, was about ghosts. Um, and these ghosts did not have any name as such. Though if we come to uh, mythology as such, and um, we will uh, actually find that in case of uh, Hindu mythology, a uh, ghost is a, actually a supernatural creature, usually is the soul of a deceased person. This is what I, what I show you on the screen is a, uh, is a mask of a ghost from South India. Um, and they are properly called bhuts or preet or the deceased, or those who have passed on in uh, most Indian languages. And uh, most of these ghosts are basically perturbed and restless souls. They're very unsettled uh, because there is some factor uh, that uh, prevents them from moving on to what uh, most Hindus believe is either to their next lives or to uh, heaven or hell. So they have not been able to move uh, on and they, they're just stuck somewhere in limbo. And uh, the, it comes really from what is called uh, an akal mrityu, so an untimely death. And um, so it could be a violent death by murder, it could be a death by suicide, it could be a death by accident. And in a country where uh, not uh, many de decades ago, there were uh, uh, the maternal mortality rate was very high. Uh, so it was for women, it was often a uh, death during childbirth that uh, would be called a kalmitya. And therefore, the, the deceased, the dead, uh, in all probability, had the chances to become a ghost or a prey. And uh, also for people who it is said that, you know, you become ghosts if you die, if you have unsettled matters in your life, if you were too attached to uh, people in your life, the good life that you had, and you didn't want to really leave it, and you had felt, um, you had felt you've been compelled to leave because um, of certain extraneous circumstances, and you would actually then, you know, come back to haunt and uh, fulfill their uh, unquenched desires. So um, you could be dangerous, you could even lead unsuspecting individuals to their death. Um, and as uh, we've already heard that a lot of the death would be uh, revenge, it would be about vengeance. And of course, one of the largest ways in which in India among Hindus that you would actually see ghosts happening, you would not see that so much now, but uh, till a few years ago would be possession. And a lot of these booths, these uh, ghosts would live in, as we know, in dark and wild and desolate spaces. And uh, they would crowd those locations that would evoke death and destruction and desolation. So these would be, you know, crematoriums, it could be cemeteries, there would be remote mountains, they could be really dense forests, and they could be very derelict or uh, crumbling uh, buildings and other structures. Or even inside rooms, inside rooms where untimely deaths have occurred. Um, and uh, ghosts in uh, Hindu mythology are uh, believed uh, to energize themselves, you know, uh, at some particular times. It's not always spaces that where they are. It's also particular times. It's the midnight. It's uh, the night of the new moon. These are also when, you know, uh, the shadows of dusk lengthen and uh, where you can't really see very clearly uh, what your next step is if you're walking outside. And um, of course, the living human beings, they experience their visitations a lot. Uh, and the living are understandably terrified of ghostly presences, and they do feel a loathing towards them. And yet there is a magnetic allure, and which uh, brings people back to discussing ghosts. Um, so this is basically where we in uh, India, especially um, those uh, who are brought up within Hindu idioms, uh, come in uh, for the ghost. So you see here also on the screen from South India, from Tulunad in Karnataka, a uh, ghost mask of, uh, uh, of dancers who would wear that and would actually call in and invoke uh, uh, 
uh, ghosts there. However, now I need to really uh, state that uh, the pervasiveness of you know, these spirits and ghosts and specters are on the decline. And uh, one of the reasons is of course, uh, modern education, which um, in a sense uh, is telling us, and we've heard this a lot also in the questions that there are no things like ghosts. There are no real quote unquote again, phenomenon like ghosts, but well, uh, so you don't really have to be afraid of them. They're not there. Of course, rapid urbanization is a very big factor. Places are no longer so desolate where you stay. Uh, there is increasing electrification. In fact, I have uh, often heard during my work uh, in the districts and in rural areas where people would say that, you know, now that there is electric light, there are very few ghosts that comes. So, you know, this increasing electrification, uh, especially in rural areas in the countryside, there is the, and the expanding reach of uh, and access to modern medicine in the sense that I will come to uh, ghost possession, which is uh, the most popular, uh, uh, let's say, um, visual uh, experience of ghosts for a lot of people in India. So, and a lot of those possessions are supposed to be um, treated by uh, uh, traditional doctors, but with the, uh, with the expanding reach of, of modern medicine and access to modern medicine and psychiatry, uh, a lot of that is also disappearing. Of course, the building of roads and human settlements and the leading to the disappearance of forests, uh, forests becoming increasingly places for tourism. So uh, increasingly places where you actually enjoy yourself and you are afraid actually. And of course, uh, a phenomenon which is taking place all across India is a very swift absorption of a lot of tribes and castes into uh, Brahmanic ritual systems. And I don't want to go in deeply into this, but uh, Brahmanic ritual systems tend to, uh, you know, uh, de-emphasize beliefs in ghosts and um, uh, things like that. When I say Brahmanic ritual systems, it means it is also dealing with the fact that, you know, you ghosts no longer keep can possess you if you are ritually protected. So, the increasing absorption of a lot of castes and communities within Brahmanic ritual systems is contributing to this. Now, this is a background, and I will still have a want to have a discussion on um, this. You see, again, is a, a very popular representation of what would be considered a ghost in India. Um, you can see a lot of their pictures on, you know, trucks, on buses, on public transport. You will see it in sometimes in temples, you will see them in illustrations in children's books and other things. So um, um, sometimes this is like, it, it can be frightening, it can even be a caricature of what people think. Okay, here is, uh, I want to talk to you about a Bengali novelist in this context, uh, Trilokanath Mukhopadhyay, who lived between uh, 1847, died in 1919. And he is remembered in uh, Bengal uh, as a writer of fantastic tales and ghosts and supernatural beings have frequently appeared in his stories. And he's been actually a very, very important figure of the Bengal Renaissance. And many of his writings contain a polemic against the belief in ghosts. I was talking to you about uh, the, you know, the swift absorption of communities into Brahmanic ritual systems. With the ritual systems, they were also being observed, uh, absorbed uh, largely into Brahmanic uh, beliefs, uh, perspectives of the world. And part of what he, uh, Trilokanath Mukhopadhyay was also, uh, was uh, strongly attacking superstitious beliefs uh, of uh, in, uh, people in India, uh, including the belief in the supernatural. And for a long time, a lot of, uh, um, you know, uh, researchers have often highlighted Trilokanath Mukhopadhyay, um, who's very well known uh, for his uh, series like Domarudhar and Konkabuti and creation of a, a ghost for Lulu, a very endearing ghost actually. And um, uh, he's been known as somebody who was a rationalist, but uh, there has been a re-evaluation and I will talk about this, uh, talk about this person because he sort of uh, represents uh, what at present, I would say largely Hindus will look at how look, Hindus look at ghosts. He himself actually later in life and his son uh, as Sudhir Kumar, uh, his son testifies often that um, actually he did have a belief in spirits and uh, he did make uh, his son Sudhir Kumar a medium 
in uh, seances and uh, um, he would often contact spirits of other, uh, you know, leading Ren Bengal Renaissance figures. And, um, and it's not really that he did not seriously believe in uh, afterlife. He has written in his later life about the fact that, you know, there are spirits and he was uh, also very deeply involved with the Theosophical Society, which many of you here will know had uh, um, a lot of, uh, you know, uh, they also were linked later into research into the paranormal uh, in some way or the other. Uh, but, um, you know, Trilokunath actually, in a sense, was also a creator of a very new genre of, uh, you know, literature in Bengal in the name of uh, ghost stories. Uh, this you will find is actually uh, from the YouTube. This is uh, one of his stories, which uh, he adapted around Arthur Conan Doyle's uh, The Brown Hand. Uh, many of you might have read that story. And this was his Bengali adaptation of that. And um, what this story actually uh, meant uh, was that, um, that there is something, something unexplained somewhere. And, um, the, and the ghost story is a very modern Bengali literature phenomenon. Before that, folk stories about ghosts, or even in, in mythology or in general, you know, Sanskrit narratives, uh, uh, ghost stories have often been about uh, the protagonist encountering a ghost and uh, outwitting the ghost or um, using the ghost for something. So uh, it, it never really dwelt a lot around uh, the emotion of fear, but um, the real exploration of fear in uh, literature started there. So on one hand, uh, somebody like Trilokonath and the Renaissance figures and uh, at the way uh, the evolution was happening in the way we looked at ghosts. So on one hand, it was superstition uh, that we need to be more rational and uh, ghosts did not exist. On the, other hand, on the other hand was this very lingering sense of, uh, you know, the supernatural, something, um, you know, which is uh, beyond explanation. Uh, coming uh, to um, the supernatural and etc. cetera, like, uh, coming directly back again, I just want to move back in time into um, Hindu mythology. And let me make it clear that, you know, the word mythology as it is used in uh, the West may not be the right word to talk about what I will be talking here, because uh, whatever uh, the, the stories and the narratives that go by myth in India are also theological. They, are, they have their ritual context and they actually also have their philosophical context. So they are not in, um, not, uh, mythology, mythology proper in the sense that you know myth is not uh, is something really unreal. Yes, um, in terms of um, mythology, in terms of uh, course, in the Hindu scheme of things, there is a lot of Puranic and Ayurvedic literature which talks about grahas. Grahas literally are a Sanskrit for grasper or a possessor. You can see in this picture. Um, in a shrine in uh, India, um, women who have been who are possessed and are undergoing you know exorcist exorcism right rituals, and these grahas have been both female and male. And primarily, we have found in Indo mythology that uh, they first make an appearance as uh, you know as outside entities who possess children and cause their illnesses and death, and um, in fact, they are supposed to be in the realm of the god uh, Skanda Kumar or Kartikeya, as we say. Um, Kartikeya has a very, very popular cult in uh, South India and is still worshipped by Bengali Hindus, actually, because, um, because he's supposed to grant progeny and he's uh, supposed to protect children. And uh, so, But it's well documented that the entire uh, evolution of this god, whom we also see uh, in the same frame, uh, uh, with uh, the goddess Durga in the Durga Puja of Calcutta, uh, actually has evolved from uh, a graha, a, a possessor, a ghost, a spirit. And also it's similar with the, his brother in mythology, the other son of goddess Durga, and that is Ganesha, and whose uh, who's, uh, evolution from the Vinayaka spirits, Vinayakas actually, actually meant, uh, you know, very harmful spirits uh, in very old uh, literature, Sanskrit literature. And, that journey from you know a Vinayaka spirit who creates a lot of obstacles who uh, will never uh, you know let you be at peace to uh, uh, to Ganesha is has been very uh, documented very well, but at the same time uh, 
the moment we come to grahas and ghosts and bhutas and then we come to possession of how bhutas possess people uh, we have to look at ayurvedic literature and ayurvedic literature actually uses grahas as um, you know as as it's, as as a as a diagno as a diagnosis as a term of a di of a di diagnosing uh, sort of a mental illness and it um, talks about uh, bhutonmada it's called bhutonmada is in its insanity which is caused by bhutas or spirits and um, deals with spirits and spirit possession a lot in the old literature and it has actually an elaborate taxonomy of bhutas a lot of bhutas there are there are bhutas like yakshas there are rakshasas rakshasas are largely um, bhutas who are very angry and aggressive and um, uh, then there are pishachas pishachas would be uh, bhutas who are uh, who want to who lurk in places which are otherwise considered dirty uh, and polluting and of course there are uh, even devas and gods uh, you know possession by gods would also be considered bhutonmada Uh, uh causes of insanity and uh, ayurveda has this uh, you know detailed uh, discussion about uh, if there is a particular ghost a particular pishacha who takes possession of you what would be your behavior what would be the uh, your biological indicators of that uh, what would be the behavioral indicators at that and it really goes uh, to the extent that it uses this word called sahishnuta which actually means uh, emotional resilience so it says that you know bhutan mada is caused in persons who uh who lack emotional resilience and um and then turn to unhealthy coping mechanisms and they also uh say that you know who are the people uh, who are like sit almost like you know sitting ducks for uh, bhutas to possess them and they use this word called alpasatva which means that you know um which, uh, which are generally translated into something like pe uh, people who cannot uh in face of trauma and stress somehow fail to optimize their energies of resilience and um uh, they have uh, suboptimal capacities to do that and very important very important that people who lack support systems to help them uh, to deal with this which is very very important a very very important uh, thing to say so even in terms of a very traditionalist hindu view uh bhutas or ghosts could not only be seen as uh, supernatural uh, entities they would also be seen in terms of uh, psychiatric uh, psychiatric i don't want to use the word psychiatric for ayurveda but just to explain to people that also in terms of mental illness uh and also it, that it squarely points uh, to uh, uh, social uh, structures and systems and uh, there has been a lot of uh, you know work on possession uh, in india and but before i go to that uh, i would say that you know ayurveda clearly very clearly talks about the fact that um, it is the fear that is caused by violent individuals in the life of human beings it is the fear that is caused by raj purushas i mean people in the government the state uh it is the fear that is caused uh, because you have no resources because you are poor it is the fear that uh, of social rules especially those social rules that govern sexuality and prevent uh forging of relationships uh these are not my interpretations they are very clearly written in ayurvedic literature that you know these are the fears that actually lead to ghost infestations to possess uh, to possessions so coming back again just to point out is to you know why as a social worker would uh, my uh, you know my engagement with ghosts would come in is that uh, ayurveda somewhere is not only looking at this as a very supernatural phenomenon it's looking as not only a psychological phenomenon but also as a social phenomenon and this has been for say quite a few thousand years now uh, within ayurvedic uh, literature uh there has been a lot of research uh, where i don't want to really quote so many researches here but one by h e ulrich in 1992 uh, um there was this research about how among brahmin women actually and their possessions that would happen and um uh, they've shown how uh, you know possession spirit possession was a way of expressing emotions and desire among the women and women often use this possession as a very strategic and a very conscious way to escape ill treatment of in-laws or postpone unwanted marriage in case of you know unmarried young girls 
or even uh, you know the way to deal with the fear of being either poisoned or being killed by in-laws. So possession uh, has often, and you see a lot of women in the picture. Uh, though let me uh, let me actually challenge the stereotype that you know it's only women who get um, uh, who, who are possessed by ghosts because a lot of research have actually shown that it's not just women; it's also men. Uh, especially the fact that you might get to see more women is because in our patriarchal society, more women are, you know, uh, at the receiving end of things and they often use possession as the strategy and a conscious way to escape that sort of ill treatment. So there is uh, this very extensive research as I was talking around and much of the literature here also focuses on the pain and the suffering and the distress of those that undergo illness or possession by spirits. Uh, Sudhir Kakkar, who is a psychoanalyst, uh, an Indian psychoanalyst, has actually also pointed out how ideas related to purity and untouchability and pollution uh, direct the development of emotional reactions to event and phenomena among Hindu communities. So there's big obsession about you know, being pure, about not being polluted, about what to touch, what not to touch, from food to clothing to even human beings. I mean, this creates an environment where uh, many people, one of the biggest complaints that they have, uh, you know, is that in, they feel very impure inside their body and this impurity becomes such an obsession that, you know, according to Kakar, it actually generates uh, neurosis. Uh, and a lot of the neurosis and I would say psychosis uh, is often uh, comes out in uh, possession. And a lot of psychoanalysts who've been working with, you know, traditional healers, have been documenting uh, that. But however, the point of uh, this talk is not to really, uh, let me uh, tell you that this is not to, this is another picture in a shrine. Uh, the point of this talk is not to reduce Bhutan mother to just pathology, you know, or just to say that, you know, okay, in, that this is to be interpreted only in terms of Western medicine. And uh, I will not even reduce it to the fact that, okay, that Ayurveda says that so all Hindus believe or all Hindu views about Bhutan mother, about uh, ghosts and spirits is about, uh, you know, mental illness. Uh, I would um, actually hark back to Trilokanath uh, Mukhopadhyay again. So as, uh, so what I call for, you know, as a social worker is to locate this entire traditional discourse on ghosts and spirits within a social and cultural context. Um, because it is only then that it helps social workers deal with the fear and the root psycho psychosocial causes that cause such fear among people we work with. And uh, needless to say, um, the less privileged people are, the more vulnerable they are to fear, grasping them and playing havoc with their lives. I mean, that is, I think, something which is uh, very clear. But I was also, like I was saying, that with more urbanization, more electrification, um, and uh, so many other things, changes that are happening, uh, a lot of, um, you know, uh, ghost possessions actually are actually reducing, you know, there has been, uh, there is a, another uh, a study by uh, Murphy Halliburton in 2005, where he studied uh, spirit possession in uh, South India. And he says that, you know, there is a slight shift and uh, it seems an irre irrevocable shift from, you know, uh, uh, of the use of a lot of, uh, uh, common Hindus, terms uh, like tension, terms like depression are used, and terms for psych uh, uh, the spirit possession are being increasingly, you know, ab being abandoned. So um, there is a lot of psychological idioms that are coming in as, and he basically talks about how the word tension is used uh, there. And for a lot of us, when we also speak to people, we tension has become one of these, those English words, which are very well recognized. In, um, by most Indians. So uh, he is also saying that how over time, um, you know, a lot of this uh, spirit possession uh, phenomena is decreasing and people who are facing similar problems are actually going to uh, psychiatrists and are saying that, you know, they have this tension or they, and very, they, uh, in India, a lot of people use the word depression also very loosely. So they also lose, uh, use uh, that word. Now, um, Coming back uh, to um, um, possession um, and how uh, Hindus see ghosts, uh, tarpana is a, is, a, is a ritual that Hindus uh, uh, undertake uh, every October, uh, just before 
you know, the Durga Puja and the worship of the goddess that happens there. And this Tarpana literally means to satisfy. And um, what is this ritual? It's a, it's a satisfact, you satisfy with water and with some jingeli seeds and sesame seeds. You go to a water body, you take that water and, with, and you chant some uh, mantras and you are offered the water to your ancestors. And um, this ritual uh, actually uh, presents this entire cycle of birth and death and ancestors within a, a larger universal context because one of the mantras that it says uh, through which you offer water is uh, Brahmadi Stamba Paryantam Jagat Triptyantam. That means from the lowliest clutch of grass that there is there on earth to Brahman, which is the conscious and the blissful principle that lies realized in the whole world, may the whole creation, may the whole world uh, be satisfied. And one of the reasons that every common Hindu will give you for a spirit, for the, for the human being, uh, the dead human being to become a ghost is that he's a tripta, he's dissatisfied, he's discontented. Something in his life has gone amiss. He's anxious, he is even angry. And that is what uh, makes him uh, into, uh, into a ghost. So this entire ritual is literally uh, talking about placating. It is talking about appeasing. Tarpa naturally means pacification. It means you know satisfying somebody. So it is a continuous yearly ritual where the living are offering water to the dead to either in terms of redemption or redressing grievances that, that they might have had so that uh, they can be happy and they, they can go to the next world. Their, the, the channel of their transmigration that has been blocked uh, is, uh, is sundered and kept open. So let me uh, conclude with another story, um, a story of uh, the god Shiva's emergence, you know, as the dancer, as Nataraja, as most of you will uh, have, may, may, may have seen this uh, icon. And um, I will tell you the story first before I talk about how this very paradigmatic story of healing uh, and how it re relates to, you know, within Hindu mythology and uh, into ways Hindus will look at uh, ghosts and spirits. Um, so, um, there were these sages, these very wise sages who lived in uh, a forest of pines in the Himalayas. And they would perform endless rites and uh, they would also torture their bodies through a lot of ascetic practices because they thought that this was the only way to liberation. You know, but the stories say, the Purana says that, you know, while they were actually performing all these endless rites, they had no love of God. They did not love God. And Shiva was aware of these ignorant ways. And Shiva, the God, the supreme godhead in this story was aware of the fact that you know they that a lot of these sages who lived in the forest actually did not love him actually did not love god and he wanted to do something about it so he requested the other god vishnu uh, to transform himself and this vishnu is known for his capacity to uh, transform himself from a male to a female so uh, shiva requested vishnu to transform himself into a bewitchingly beautiful uh, woman called Mohini. And with her, she, uh, he entered this forest of pines. So Shiva took off his tiger skin that he was wearing and stark naked, he held his begging bowl and trident. And once in the forest, he asked Vishnu, who was Mohini, to proceed to where the sages were performing their rituals. So he said, please go ahead, go to, go to the place where uh, sages are performing the rituals and just test all the tortures and the aesthetic practices they were going through and bewilder them. and and go disturb their vows and rituals because they will be disturbed. So seeing Mohini, uh, the sages were overwhelmed and they lost control of themselves and they threw all of their rules and regulations and norms to the winds. And as uh, the narrative says, they clustered around Mohini like locusts, locusts drawn to flames. And at the same time, uh, Shiva also proceeded to the street where the sages live, where the sages had their houses and where the wives of the sages were going about the usual lives. So Shiva was singing melodious tunes and he had appeared in that street like a beggar as if he was begging for arms from the women in the houses. And the women heard his song and they rushed out onto the street. And the moment they saw him, they were overwhelmed by desire for him. Uh, for them, to them, uh, Shiva, this beggar was one of the most handsome persons, one of the most attractive persons in the world. 
And um, as the narrative says, that their breath trembled, they grew faint, their bodies burned, and, and even their clothes fell off. I mean, everything that was happening to the women was, you know, boundaries were melting away somewhere. And please keep this word in mind as we uh, go on with this narrative and we come to the end of it. So they were, uh, the literature says that they were sinking into a deep ocean that is called wanting God. And he went about the streets somewhere. He played his veena, his uh, lute, his musical instrument. Somewhere he was sing singing about his uh, about Shiva's own his own um, uh, his own uh, deeds, and he was recounting his tales. And um, he just was moving around with uh, a flood of mad women following and flowing around him. So meanwhile, Vishnu uh, was also leading the sages out from where they were actually performing their rituals towards the streets where they lived and uh, 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 Vishnu joined Shiva there. And as soon as the sages saw Shiva and the state their wives were in, they were enraged. And they, they started wishing death upon their wives. They just wanted their wives to die because they were so angry with what they thought was, you know, that the modesty had been outraged and, and the women were not repentant at all. And that was really making them very angry. And they soon realized, you know, once they saw this, that, okay, these were not uh, ordinary. This was not an ordinary woman. This was not an ordinary beggar. This was Shiva and this was Vishnu in disguise. And the sages then decided to exact revenge. So they decided to perform a violent sacrifice and uh, kill Shiva, the beggar. They wanted to kill Shiva. So, and uh, they lit a fire, they lit a sacrificial fire. All the sacrifices here in India among Hindus would be uh, lighting a fire. And they started chanting uh, their mantras. They were chanting, uh, they made lots of chants. They were pouring lots of substances into the fire. And from them amidst the flames, fearful creatures arose. And so the first creature that arose was, for example, was a tiger. It was a fearsome tiger. And the sages uh, instructed the tiger, go attack Shiva. But what happened was when the tiger attacked Shiva, Shiva flayed his skin and made that skin and draped it around his body. And that's part of Shiva's iconography. If you see the popular iconography, you will find that you know Shiva um, was, has uh, the tiger skin draped around him. I will show you some pictures of this uh, you know, Shiva before I go forward. Uh, this is the Shiva, Shiva who's begging in the streets. You can see the, uh, the women on his, on his right um, and who's actually offering arms, uh, food to Shiva, but you can see that you know her clothes are no longer where uh, uh, they are supposed to be. Um, this is Mohini and uh, this is Vishnu, and you can see the sages who've lost control. And um, here is a chola bronze of Shiva, and I will be using this to take my uh, story forward. So, a tiger, so a Shiva actually flayed the tiger and wore the skin around him. Is uh, and then the sages sent a lethal hatchet uh, out from the fire. And when the hatchet came flying to Shiva, Shiva just grabbed it and made it his weapon. Uh, then there was this uh, doe that came out. This doe was, she was screaming and she attacked Shiva and Shiva sort of tamed her and held up high in his hand. You can see the doe there, um, you know, uh, being fed by Shiva on his right. Um, then there were snakes, there were millions of snakes that uh, you know, came out and Shiva made all the snakes as ornaments. Again, very traditional iconography of Shiva will have uh, snakes around him. There were lots of ghouls and ghosts that uh, you know, the, uh, the, the sages sent towards Shiva and they all became his army. You can see uh, two different ghosts and ghouls uh, symbolically besides Shiva there in that place. And they, after that, they sent, sent a skull and a skull which was laughing horribly. And uh, Shiva just picked up the skull and wore it in his uh, matted hair. And this was very confusing for the sages. The sages were becoming very perplexed. And finally, they sent uh, a lethal mantra uh, which would kill Shiva. But those mantras congealed into that little, on the right hand, you see that little small beating drum that would, was pounding out deafening rhythms. And Shiva uh, actually caught those drums in his hand and started belting out rhythms from them. And whatever remained of the fire now, of that sacrificial fire, Shiva picked up uh, the remaining fire and uh, he started dancing his, uh, and you see the Bhutas here. This is a traditional picture of Sh Shiva who's uh, leading this whole hordes of ghosts. And um, then Shiva started his dance and this is Nataraja. 
as uh, we often, uh, we all know about a very, very famous icon of Shiva and he started dancing. But uh, before dancing, just look at the creature uh, just under the feet of Shiva. This is Apasmara. Apasmara in Sanskrit means somebody whose memory has been erased and obliterated. It literally in Ayurveda, it means epilepsy because it signifies sort of a loss of consciousness, a spasmodic movement, a sort of swallowing of the tongue leading to loss of speech. And in a sense, an encapsulation uh, of oneself within oneself, totally cut off from others. So this is Apasmara and Apasmara was the last demon to be sent to Shiva. And what did Shiva do? And Shiva just uh, sort of uh, threw Apasmara, gently kicked him and threw him to the ground. And as he lay prone on the ground, Shiva pressed his foot on his spine and started dancing. Ananda Tandava, Ananda means ecstasy. This was the dance of bliss. So what actually was actually happening in this entire story was that Shiva being the center of all creation, when he's creating from inside, so it's like from the center moving towards the periphery in the circles. So all the sages and all creations were all uh, fragments of Shiva. And while when Shiva is united and the whole of creation is united, when Shiva then is all fluid inside, but as Shiva started fragmenting into you know, trees, into plants, into animals, into human beings, into the sages, as his, the substance inside him, was being fragmented, they were also petrifying. They were becoming turning into stone because they were losing connections with each other. So all these different uh, parts of Shiva, which were going into creation, which was being disgorged into the creation, were coming from this uh, continuous fluid source, but they were like separating out, fragmenting out into uh, different parts. So um, just like Apasmara, Apasmara is that forgetfulness, that memory, uh, which is no longer there, that I have been, like for the sages, have been actually part of Shiva there. So I personally, as a sage, do not really look at that commonality, that I have, I, like everything else, have emerged from that one particular center, but I look at myself as a fragmented individual, having lost connection with everybody else, and I petrify, I become, stupef I become stupefied. And uh, through this entire myth, the story is that every time that I, the sages sent uh, uh, the tiger, the hatchet, the doe, the snakes, the gaul, the skulls, and Apasmara, they were wanting to kill Shiva. But what Shiva was doing was actually reintegrating all these separate elements which had uh, separately existed. He was reintegrating into himself. So you can see that sacrificial fire on his uh, left hand. You can see the drum on his right hand. And uh, with the and you can see all the snakes uh, there. You could, there's a skull on his uh, feet, and with his uh, you know with his uh, right hand, which is pointing downwards to his feet, he's actually uh, showing his that, that bent leg, that bent leg where uh, uh, all uh, which which talks about the flow of creation of the fluidity of what a person is. So the sages had actually lost connection with their Shiva, and they had come to the surface of that circle. And once they had come to the surface, everything ended there. There was no uh, fluidity left. They had become stone. And they considered and that there was totally incomplete. There was a discontinuity of the natural order of the cosmos. And Shiva to them, of course, was the violent, destructive, strange intruder. To somebody who has lost connection, uh, the ghost that comes in is that Shiva, who is the violent and destructively strange intruder. And um, Therefore, uh, what you can see in the, in the picture of Netraja, the circle behind it. So there is this uh, spin, the vortex, because every time that Shiva starts dancing, he, through that dance, through that spin, he tries to take everything in. All those disjointed, fragmented uh, uh, entities are all coming together in one free flow. So. Um, most of the ghosts are therefore often depicted, you know, as in you know, contorted, twisted, in convoluted fashions in sculpture. Uh, they deviate from very typical, um, you know, ways of human beings. They are like the banished, they are like outsider, there's, there's a fear that they have. And um, this Nataraja story, for example, is, <clears throat> is, is a story of healing. And uh, this is a story of healing not only for those afflicted by Bhutan Mada, 
but also those who gaze at, those who consider as the mad, the insane, and the disoriented. It's a healing for both. It's not just a healing for somebody in whom uh, the Bhuta has entered. It's also a healing for somebody who sees that uh, particular person. I want to end uh, what I have to say with this particular picture. This uh, particular picture is one of the, uh, let's say, celebrations of the explorations of fear of some of the children that I work with. When And you, I showed you some of the pictures in the beginning where the children had actually um, uh, painted themselves in terms of the fears that they have. Um, so this was through using theater and other art mode to actually confront their fears and understand them. So this is where a lot of other children who were not part of this um, exercise was also sitting. This is something that they had prepared this entire uh, theater as part of the theater. And in this theater, finally, what happened was that uh, a lot of the children were actually shown the mirror. So this is what the children themselves designed. And every time that uh, a child felt afraid, a mirror was shown to the child and the child was looking at himself or herself. And uh, in a sense, that was one of the ways in which the child was coming to terms uh, with fear. So um, as, as a social worker, we are dealing with fear all the time. We are dealing with misogyny. We are dealing with racism. We are dealing with homophobia. We are actually these, we are dealing with a lot of ghost infestations among a lot of otherwise <clears throat> normal people. And our thing is to actually show the mirror, to show the mirror that how disconnected they are. And that fear vanishes, fear of the unknown, fear of the other vanishes when that connection is established. And that is where, uh, you know, we as um, our, uh, you know, as, a so as social workers actually deal with ghosts, uh, ghosts who might have been banished uh, because of medicine, but their ghosts still exist inside us as fear of very different things. So I stop here, uh, Prashjit. Uh, thank you so much, Deepda, for this fantastic talk. It was, it was amazing. Uh, so we have a couple of questions um, in the chat box, for, but before uh, that, I would like to ask you um, a couple myself. So, um, so do you think that the, that the presence of ghosts um, has to do also with the practice of, you know, forgiveness by Brahmin priests, you know, of rituals linked to salvation? Is it is it is it there because of uh, these practices by priests? Uh, as you, as I was telling you, you know, Ayurveda is is uh, something which was actually controlled and uh, transmitted uh, by Brahmins for a lot of time. And uh, like as uh, Brahmins are, uh, I mean, uh, Brahminic culture has been. There was a pathologization of uh, ghosts. So every time that within uh, uh, you have, when you pathologize that and you say that you know this is not uh, an, uh, any being outside you, it's something inside you. Uh, to that extent, uh, you know, the, this belief in ghost sort of uh, collapses. But there has been a lot of, uh, also I will uh, quote from some uh, research about the Taru, Taru community in the Nepal Tarai, uh, where they have been tribals for a long time and they have their own traditional uh, witch doctors, if I put, uh, if I put it in that way. Uh, but their uh, death and mortuary rituals are uh, undertaken by uh, Brahmins. So those rituals actually tell them that, you know, okay, this death, whatever has happened is going to be very smooth. It's uh, this person is now going to move into the afterlife, maybe to another life, maybe to heaven, and there will be no uh, questions of the person being really enraged. And so there is a lot of emphasis on the rituals being done in a correct way, fashion. If, if, uh, if have I answered the question that you're asking me? Yes, absolutely. So, so also the, there's, a, there's a point that in Christianity that we have this a binaristic opposition between God and Satan, you know, the good and evil. But uh, in Hinduism, there is a kind of coexistence and cohabitation, I think, between you know what is in the, you know what is good and what is evil, the gods and the and, and the rakshasas. Actually, again, you know, when you use words like English words like good and evil, it really does not uh, bring out the, the the continuum of this. It's just like uh, at different points, if um, something is in control and something is not in control. So uh, something is pure and something is impure. So there's this huge continuum and a lot of uh, you know gray areas. And I think uh, that is the that is why I often say that you know the uh, what what we call Hindu mythology cannot really be treated in this this binary binary fashion. It has to be it's it's like a continuous flow. And the only thing that you can do is in a very strategic way you can see for this i can look at it as you know a, a black and white opposing and here i see a red and blue opposing each other but then a red and blue opposing each other is not the same as black and white opposing each other and sometimes blue and red can get together and black and whatever 
I mean, and red and blue can also be at the same time if you take it to another level. So that keeps happening. It's 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 like uh, you know the the, the circle behind uh, Nataraja. I was saying so the entire thing is like a vortex. It's a it's a spin that is happening, and uh, depending on where you are in that spin, your perspectives uh, keep shifting. Right, and, and and the last question is something which has always bothered me. So, for example, you know when we imagine ghosts, um, when we are afraid of uh, something unknown or some uh, an unknown entity, it's always the Western ghost which, that we are scared of. You know, uh, maybe because of popular media. You know, we, we do not have a conception and image of the Hindu ghost. You know, can you say something regarding that? Because you are never scared of that. You know, actually, this is where, uh, you know, I remember one of our uh, professors in Jadavpur University, Shukumari Bhattacharjo, had written this uh, big thing about, you know, why there has been no tragedy in traditional Indian literature, why India never produced tragedy as such. Now, uh, I don't want to go into that. What I just want, I had touched a little bit about is, is that whatever stories and narratives about ghosts are very related to, um, you know, as I said, some a hero, a protagonist, uh, outwitting a ghost in a contest or um, sort of defeating a ghost and sort of then the ghost disappears. So establishing uh, sort of something like uh, control over the ghost. So everything in India, uh, the narrative structure in India before our colonial encounter has been one of, let's say, well, not like, you know, I heard like the uh, husband and wife walking uh, up the stairs, but something like a happy ending. So whatever things happen, happen in between, and then somebody is really able to integrate. So at the end of the day, whether it is Abhigyan Shakuntalam, which Rabun, Rabinath Tagore wrote about and analyzed it, it is always about integrating the disconnected entities of oneself together. So you sort of recollect them back again into one uh, whole. So as a result, uh, actually, when you look at it after the reconnection has been done, as it is done in the story, the course doesn't really, um, you know, is not so fearful after all there. Yeah, so we have a couple of questions here. One from Mahima, uh, who asks the concept of a witch in India is often conceptualized in a beautiful manner with magic trapped in their hair, which is of course very attractive. So why is that she's asking? Well, uh, the, uh, the, the free flowing hair um, in India is, uh, you know, has been one of the iconographic parts, uh, you know, very characteristics of Kali and Kali like deities and Dakinis and Yoginis and all of that. And actually would mean many things, you know, uh, uh, these icons are not only about, uh, you know, symbols for certain things. Often they're also linked to a lot of yogic practices. So we don't get into those quotes there, but largely it is about the freedom because the ultimate, whether it is the it is considered to be the female or the male, the ultimate is always um, you know characteristic as swatantra, as somebody who rule is ruling himself or herself. So that free flowing hair is always something somebody who is unbound totally, who's part of that that chaos, that fluid chaos, which is not fragmented itself. Right. So, so the last question is from Ankita Sarkar, who asks, uh, why do why do we mostly refer to women as ghosts? For instance, words like Daini, Bhutini, uh, references to be, you know, to, can be found in Thakumar Juli as well. Uh, one is that, you know, there is, uh, as I said, in the taxonomy of ghosts, if you really go and look into it, there are, there are, there are lots of uh, male ghosts also. So, for example, um, you know, Ganesha was actually is a male ghost turned into a god. I mean, I don't want people now to rush at me because, you know, I've said something sacrilegious, but if you really go into the history of it, uh, it's, it's that, that, that it, what it, what it was. And in among Santal tribals, there is this ghost called a Kudra. A Kudra is always a small boy. It was a small boy with a pot belly and who's already always guarding treasure. You can understand how linked this Kudra is with, uh, with the figure of Ganesha. So there are uh, male uh, ghosts also, but you know, uh, why most women are referred to as Daini and Puti and etc. Even in uh, Thakur Mar Juli and etc. This is may not be the place to really go into it. But please remember that Thakur Mar Juli is, is, is a projection of young uh, children's mind, mostly the young boy's mind and how uh, young boys perceive uh, the mother figures in their uh, lives. Um, because it's, it's, it's a very strange thing because I work with young boys and uh, 
the same sort of ambivalence about the mother comes in through even now in different circumstances. So uh, perhaps that's one of these reasons why that is uh, referred to because um, I will tell you that a lot of stories in Thakur Marchuli, which you mentioned, uh, is actually uh, mostly written from the perspective of boys. But in the stories collected in Thakur Dar Chuli, if you go in, you will find a lot of different stories where the protagonists are girls and it's from the from perspectives of what the girl is doing. So here, as you say, Daini Bhutani is all happening. It's, it's the fear of the other and the fear of the other is for the young boy is the adult uh, woman, the mother, the mother figure, the sort of uh, the punishments that she receives, et cetera, et cetera. So that is there, but I don't want to really go uh, deep, uh, deep into it. I'm not a psychoanalyst. I'm just a social worker then. So I don't want to go really go deep into it, but that is there. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much, Deepda. Um, and, and my heartfelt gratitude to all the three speakers for being a part of this session. Um, for, yeah, for being immensely lucid and patient and, 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 and taking us places we fit to tread. Uh, it was quite an opening of graves to, you know, to call back the dead, uh, a kind of literary songs. So, and, and thanks to all the participants for, for the support and cooperation. So thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. It's uh, been a wonderful session and uh, thank you for organising. It's just uh, to hear so much kind of richness and to have this conversation across the globe has just been in, an incredible moment for me. So I really, really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yes, totally agree. Thank you so much. Really an honour to be here and be part of this. So thank you for including me. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yeah.